many of you in life already live by a belief system that says, in my life, whatever happens, it happens because I've created it, if not by my physical actions, by my consistent thoughts? How many follow that? Say, I. Ah, then all we're doing is asking you to live by your own beliefs. There's a gentleman I have the privilege to work with, and I've worked with him now for five years, who's a financial trader, one of the top on earth. In fact, he made a half a billion dollars in one day. Now, you can't live on that, but it's a good start. And um, there's only one man on earth that I'm aware of that's made more money in a day, and that's a man named George Soros, who's also a financial trader, who made a billion dollars in one day. But this gentleman I work with, and I've worked with him for five years because he made a half billion dollars in a day and then lost money for three years. It was like the guys that go to the moon. The astronauts go to the moon, and so they look for it their whole life. They went to the moon, they came back, ticker tape parade, shook the president's hand. Now what? They got depressed because they felt like they had nothing to look forward to after being on the moon. See, if you got to go to the moon to feel a sense of adventure, then you got a problem. When you can find adventure in a smile, then you're rich. So that way you can go to the moon too but you're not waiting for the moon to have the experience that you want. And so one of the things that I really want you to experience while you're here is that you gotta be willing to take risks. Now obviously we feel we've limited the risk to the best of our ability, but you gotta make the decisions because in real life, is not like real life in America. Real life in America is if things don't go your way, you sue somebody, you blame somebody else. Real life in America is we all know that the real reason our life isn't perfect is because of our parents. If it wasn't for them, we'd our life would be working perfectly. <laughs> all right, if we didn't have to deal with all their imperfections. In fact, everybody knows now that the reason their life's not working is they came from a particular kind of family. What kind of family is that? Dysfunctional. It's the word of the 90s, isn't it? Dysfun you never heard it in the 80s, or at least not in the 70s. It's a new word, dysfunctional. Everybody's from dysfunctional family. Now it's not even unique. So what's interesting is everybody's pointing. We live in a society that's so out of control at this stage that not only do you sue somebody, but also if you commit a crime, it's somebody else's fault. Have you noticed that? That's the newest thing. It's like, it's not only someone else's fault if you screw up, but if you commit a crime, someone else must have induced that in you at one time by abusing you or doing something terrible to you. So we have two young men that take out shotguns. Remember the Mendez brothers, Menendez in LA? And they kill both their parents at point blank range. And they go to a jury trial and the jury goes, yeah, but are they really guilty? They admitted it! And they're saying, yeah, but are they guilty? Are they really guilty? It took two jury trials. That's how sad it is. We live in a society today where a woman gets upset with her husband, decides to take manners, matters into her own hands, so to speak, <laughs> takes out a big knife, middle night, and whap! And when they go to the jury trial, they go, yeah, but is she really guilty? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. If he abused her, I want him to pay. I want him punished. But there are laws for that stuff. This one woman is responsible for more men sleeping on their stomachs after a fight than any woman in history. And even, even really good religious folks, you know? I personally am a Christian, whatever people believe I'm supportive of, but I hear a lot of my Christian friends say, yeah, but you're preaching the power in you. That's not God. Where do you think it came from? I mean, think about it. I mean, it's like, where did it come from? No, if it's God's will, then my life will work. No, I got news for you. Lying on your butt watching Jerry Springer eating Cheetos is not gonna make God work for you. Right? That's not it. That's called you got a fat butt as big as Chicago. That's the problem. Okay? Because you aren't moving. That isn't God's fault. A lot of you know the old story, don't you? Story about the preacher. He's traveling across the country, preaching the gospel. Everywhere he goes. Passionate man. He gets to the Arizona deserts. He's out in the middle of the desert, and in the distance, he sees this magnificent, I mean, absolutely magnificent garden. He knows that, you know, it's obviously not real. It's obviously a mirage. But as he gets closer, it's really real. He can't even believe it. in the middle of the desert, this magnificent garden, flowers and trees and fruit and everything. So sure enough, he decides to go knock on the house. There's a house at the back of this garden. He goes and knock on the door because he wants to make sure the gardener understands who created this garden. Sure enough, he bangs on the door as hard as he can. He's very righteous. Gardener opens the door, a very kind man. He says, Mr. Minister, how can I help you? He said, sir, I just want to tell you that the Lord has done a fine job with your garden. It was very intense. The gardener looked at the minister and he smiled and he said, I understand your message. He said, I agree with you. He said, if it wasn't for the magic of the seed and the soil and the sunshine, there'd be no garden here. He said, but I can tell you something, Mr. Minister. You should have seen this place when God had it all by himself. <laughs> 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 
We got to do our part, right? So you can't blame anybody else. Got to be responsible. So tonight, while you want to be responsible, it's not just be responsible for the problem because you're going to have a great experience. But the truth is, most people, when they screw up, most people are good people. They take responsibility. They go, oh, it's my fault. In fact, sometimes they take too much responsibility. Right? Sometimes they pity themselves. That's not the goal. The truth is you're going to have a great experience tonight. What you don't want to do at the end of the night is go, look what he did to me. Because I'm not going to do anything to you. What I will do is be a good coach for you. I will like, help you steer your rudder a little bit to get you back into open seas. Because learning is remembering. Socrates said that. So maybe what we can do is remember what we already know. Maybe I can give you some words. Maybe I can give you some tools so you can remember what's already inside you so you can use it. It's not a gift that I'm going to give you. It's a gift that's inside of you. But you've got to take responsibility to give yourself the credit for it too. You want to make sure you understand you're the one doing it. And by working together, human beings can accomplish more than they do by themselves because we coach each other. That's the essence that we're talking about here. A lot of people think that their life would be great if you know, the weather was just, would cooperate. If they had great weather, does the weather determine how you feel? Yes or no? I'm hearing some yeses and no's on that. Okay. Well, some people think their relationship determines how happy or sad they are in their life. Does your relationship determine the quality of your life? Okay. Some people think the amount of money you have determines the quality of your life. Yes or no? Hmm. Some people think politicians determine the quality of life. Yes or no? One answer, everybody agrees, no. Now, the truth is the answer to all of these questions in reality is no. The weather doesn't do it. Your relationship doesn't do it. The money doesn't do it. That's the real answer. The honest answer for most of us emotionally is we'd probably say yes to some of those, right? Because we have fallen into the trance of believing that these external environments determine how we feel. Are there people who have people that totally love them, great relationships, but don't feel really happy? Yes or no? Yes or no? Are there people with tons of money who are totally unhappy, yes or no? Yes. Are there people with tons of money who are happy? Yes. Sure. So the money doesn't do either one. Money will magnify whatever you're already doing. If you're a pain, you'll have more to be a pain with. If you're loving, you'll have more to be loving with. Right? It'll just magnify. If you're fearful, you'll be even more fearful when you've got more money. Right? If you're centered, you'll be even more centered. All it does is magnify. Money doesn't do it. Relationship doesn't do it. Only one thing determines how you feel the way you communicate to yourself in that moment. You can have a lot of mo money, but if you're communicating in a way that makes you feel like there's scarcity, you're gonna feel broke. You can have a great relationship, but not feel very happy or very loving if you communicate in a way that makes yourself feel unhappy. So it's not the things in our lives, it's our communication. That is the whole ball of wax. Are there people who've been through unbelievable physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial, sexual traumas even, or abuse, whose lives have turned out phenomenally well, yes or no? And then you find somebody who's been given all the love, all the education, all the background, all the family support, all the money, all the things they thought they want, and they're a drug addict. Explain the difference. The difference is that it's never the things of your life. It's always the way you communicate. It's the meaning you make up for it. And some people take all their abundance and say, I'm abused. Some people take all the abuse and say, boy, there's a gift in here somewhere. I'm going to find it. It's all communication. Your life has nothing to do, the quality of your life has nothing to do with your real life. It has everything to do with what you communicate here. So whether you're really happy today or sad today, whether you feel like your life is a success or a failure, is not whether it's really success or a failure, it's just what you communicate. And what you communicate with certainty, you believe. And since you believe it, you feel it. And whatever you feel, that's your life. Nothing in life has any meaning except the meaning I give it. Nothing in life has any meaning except the meaning I give it. What does that mean? It means, well, one person has an experience and they say, what does this mean? They communicate to themselves, this means God hates me and my life is over because he's obviously punishing me. Someone else has the exact same experience and they go, what does this mean? And their brain says, what this means is God is challenging me to reach down deep and find out who I really am so I can do something even greater. What's the difference? The difference is one person is suicidal and the other person is driven and excited. What's the difference? Communication to oneself. There is not a single skill in your lifetime that will be more important for you to master. And there are a few people, very few people that really master it. But anyone can. It's just not the primary focus. Because we're busy doing other stuff. Thinking that if we do enough of this other stuff, we'll finally feel good. But we don't change the way we communicate, so now we reach for a drug to make ourselves feel good because we don't know any other way. 
Then we get smart and go, that's not going to work. So then a doctor who really cares and means well says, we'll help you feel better. We'll give you another drug. That seems like a natural transition from one drug to another, right? But for some reason, I'm still unhappy because I haven't changed the way I communicated myself 100%, a large amount, but not 100%. And because I haven't changed that, I still don't have the final change I'm after. The only change that will have an impact is changing your communication. And that means changing what things mean. Because here's what all the achievers of the world try to do. All of us in this room, most of you, I would say, are probably strong achievers. Most of you had to be an achiever to get here, for God's sakes. So the bottom line is, most achievers try to control events. And most achievers are pretty good at controlling a lot of events. What's happening around them, their environment, what's going on. But all achievers run into places where they can't control those events and it freaks them out. You can't control all events. You just can't. You can't control your father passing away. That's not something you control. You'd love to, but you can't. Here's what you can always control, what things mean. And when you control the meaning of something, you control the key and the secret to life itself, at least the quality of life that you want. But if you don't control this, and you keep focusing on this, you got no future. Because there's going to be a lot of these you don't like. But you know what? Even ones you don't like, you can find an empowering meaning for. And that's when life works. That's all it takes. And that all comes down to communicating well with yourself. I mean, I'll give you an example. Look at a guy like John Belushi. This guy was beloved by millions and millions of people. And you know what? He achieved all his goals. He wanted to be funny as heck. He wanted to be a national television star. He wanted to appear and play on Broadway. He wanted to be in movies. He wanted to play music. He did all the above. He wanted everybody to love him. He got tons of people to love him. He wanted to have a great wife. He did that too. Now, was this guy successful, yes or no? No, he's dead. That's called failure. Not not being negative towards his name. I thought he was a great guy, but you got to call a spade a spade. This guy was great at communicating to whom? Everyone but his. So he felt torn up inside, so he turned to drugs as a way to try and change the way he felt because he didn't change the way he communicated to himself. So now a great talent, a great spirit is gone. You must master your communication with yourself. Contrast him, for example, to a friend of mine who got shot down in Vietnam. His name is Jerry Coffey. He wrote a book a few years ago. I've known Jerry for about 10 years. Jerry was shot down. He was one of those top gun guys. Two of his guys shot down with him. He gets locked up for seven years, beat every day, tied with shackles in a cell that is not much wider than my body and six feet long. That's the width. With nothing to take care of his necessities except a little hole in the ground and a middle pan with some water in it. Beat on a regular basis, abused on a regular basis, isolated, seven years. Now what's interesting is Jerry came out of that and said that's the most powerful experience of his life. He wouldn't trade those seven years for anything else that could happen to him. You go, the guy's on drugs. No, what he did was become a master of his own communication with himself. Because here's what's interesting. What happened is every day he realized when he first got locked, he was locked up, he said, you know what, I might be here a while. And he thought for himself, okay, what does this mean? He said, you know what? If I say this means my life's over, then it is. If I say, why'd you do this to me, God? He said, I'm just gonna be you know, living here in pain. So he said, okay, how can I use this? And that was his question. And by the way, the way you change your communication with yourself is you ask a better quality of question. Questions shape our entire thinking process. In fact, thinking is nothing but the process of asking and answering questions. And the problem is most of us are asking questions of ourselves on a regular basis, but they're unconscious. We don't even notice it. We say things like, how come I always screw this up? We ask that a lot. Well, maybe you don't screw it up, but asking you shall what? Ask a lousy question, what do you get? So if you say, why do I always screw this up? You don't, but your brain's gonna come up with an answer. It says, because you're a schmuck, right? Ask a lousy question, get a lousy answer. So someone says, how come I can never lose weight? Because you're a pig. And that's what your brain will tell you. You ask a lousy question. If you say, how do I lose weight? It says, go on a diet. But then you go, oh, I hate that. Diet equals pain. So I don't want to do that. But if you say, how can I lose weight now and enjoy the process? Wow, new question, new answer. You might say, wow, I might like to go horseback riding. Maybe I'll learn to play polo or do something fun. Wow, in the midst of doing that, I don't even think about losing weight, but I will. If you want a better answer, you've got to ask a better question. And most of us have habitual questions that we don't even realize we ask that control our whole thinking. So instead of saying, why did you do this to me, God? He said, how can I use this? Good question. By asking that question, he got some new answers. And what he decided to do was to control his communication with himself. And so each day, he asked himself new questions. And the questions were, okay, let's pick a day out of my life. And he relived all the days of his life. 
He literally think the entire day through and see what he can learn from each experience of his past life because there's nothing to stimulate him there. Each day he physically stimulated himself. Did hundreds of push-ups and sit-ups even though he was getting bread and water most of the time. He came out of this thing stronger mentally, emotionally, spiritually. He said he came out closer to God than any other time in his life. He said there's no one else to talk to. So he had to create that. But what's interesting is he was shot down with two other people. One guy committed suicide in the prison. The other guy is still to this day in a psychotic ward here in the United States couple of decades later. Now, what's the difference between my friend and his friends? Only one thing. The way he, with who? That's it. I don't know it doesn't sound very sexy, but it's your whole life. And so maybe it's time to take control of it. And the way you take control of it, number one, is asking better questions. And number two, is starting to develop incantations that empower you versus those that destroy the quality of your life. Because that's what people do. I can't believe this happened to me. I can't believe this happened to me. Why does this always happen to me? And they encant negative phrases and negative questions until literally that person is immobilized or overwhelmed with negative emotion. You must ask those that empower you. And that's what he did. And that's why his life really works. So the quality of your life is the quality of your communication. And by the way, communication is not just words. Most people think of communication as words. But think of it this way. Words, research shows that when two people meet, and they're communicating. What actually influences another person to change the way they feel, to actually do something different? What affects them the most is usually not words. There's a few words to do it, but most words don't do that. In fact, the last study was done at USC, and they found that words in human communication represented only 7% of what actually influenced someone to change how they felt about something. Words are only 7%. Now, most business people, or most negotiators, most salespeople, most marketers spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out what to say and how to say it so they can get someone to respond. And while words do play a role, they're 7%, they're the smallest role in actually influencing someone to change the way they think and feel and do. So what affects us more than words is voice qualities or voice cues, as we call it. So when we think of communication, don't just think of words. Think of voice cues because voice qualities represent 38% of what actually influences someone to change how they feel. Now, what's a voice quality? Well, tonality is an obvious one. Timber, the quality of the sound. Volume, tempo, the particular pattern someone begins to speak radically affects the way we feel, doesn't it? If someone says, I love you, it feels different than if they say, I love you. I really love you. Different feeling, different experience. Just by tonality, that's all it takes. Now, what affects us even more than voice qualities, though, is physiology. And again, remember, physiology is a fancy word for how you use your physical body. Physiology represents 55% of what actually influences how we think, how we feel in the moment when someone's communicating to us. So this is true of other people as well as ourselves. So if, what's physiology? It's facial expressions. It's muscular tension or relaxation. It's the way you gesture. All of these things influence us much more than just words. If somebody looks at you like this and they say, I love you, this gives you, even if the voice sounds okay, it gives you a little different feedback than I love you. Have you ever left somebody's presence? I'm exaggerating only slightly. And you, they said something in your gut, you went, it's not gonna happen. You didn't know why, but you just knew it wasn't gonna happen. How many of you have that experience? Say I. That's because your brain is trained to look for what we call incongruencies. Incongruency is when your voice and your body and the words don't match. People notice that. So when you say, sure, they notice that. They notice when the inflection doesn't match the word. And even if they don't notice it consciously, they notice it unconsciously. And so you've got to communicate congruently. Now, this is not only true of other people, but yourself too. Now, where is this really valuable? Well, it's really valuable when you're communicating to yourself. If you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'll do it. What does your brain say? <laughs> he goes, there's no way in a million years you're not going to do it. Who are you trying to kid? I'm not stupid, you know. There's no physiology here. You're incongruent. But if you say, I'm going to do it, then your whole brain, body, everything gets, you mean it and you'll show up. So you want to not only get good at communicating well with other people, but first you've got to get good at communicating well with yourself. Does this make sense? So one of the things we want to do is get you so you are congruent so that you, when you go to do something, all of you is saying yes, not just the words, your body, your voice, everything. 
And when all three are aligned, then you have this thing called power, congruency, consistency, the capacity to get yourself to do what's necessary like that immediately. That's part of our target. And that comes from congruent communication. Good example, by the way, of congruent communication is the mafia. When they communicate, do people know exactly what they mean? Yes. In fact, if you remember, there was this one Don they were after forever, and they could never get this guy. And they finally got him a few years ago. And the reason that the, the authorities could never capture him is he understood the power of communication. And he was really smart. He protected all his communication networks. Not only when he said something, people knew what he meant, but also he protected all the ways he communicated so no one could, like, grab a hold of information. So, for example, he had an accountant for many years who was a man who could not speak and could not hear. Makes it very difficult to testify in court that way. So one day, though, what blew the whole thing up was this accountant gets called in to the mafia boss's office because the mafia boss freaks out and miss, realizes he's missing $3 million from his accounts. He pulls in this accountant who he can't talk to. So he has to talk through a finger sign, you know, interpreter. So he turns this guy and he says, to interpreter, he says, you tell this guy I'm missing $3 million. I know he has it. And I want it right now. Interpreter turns and says, he says that he's missing $3 million. He thinks you've got it, and he wants it right now. Well, the accountant gets this funny look on his face, starts flashing fingers back. I don't know why he's coming to me. I'm a trusted, loyal employee. I've been here forever. Tell him look somewhere else. Well, the mafia boss is watching his hands going back and forth in hyperspeed, right? So he turns to the interpreter. He says, what do he say? What do he say? The interpreter turns to the mafia boss and says, well, he said he's a trusted, loyal employee. He's been here forever. He doesn't have any of your money, and you have to look somewhere else. Well, the mafia boss didn't have much patience, so he pulled out a very big gun, put it direct at the head of the accountant, started screaming, you tell that accountant I want my money right now. I'm blowing his brains out. The interpreter turns, starts flashing signs. He says he's very upset. He knows you have the money. He wants it right now. He's going to blow your brains out. Right? All of a sudden, this accountant starts flashing signs very, very rapidly. He'll stop him, stop him, stop him. I'll tell you where the money is. It's in my cabin by the lake under my bed. Well, the mafia boss is watching his hands going back and forth at incredible speed. He turns to the interpreter and says, what do you say? What do you say? And the interpreter turns to the mafia boss and says... He says he doesn't think you have enough guts to pull that trigger. <laughs> Moral of the story. <laughs> we don't want to misinterpret ourselves this weekend, right? Now, if you're going to be effective then in communicating, you probably should know how your brain functions. I mean, understand what really triggers your brain to work. Now, we understand, first of all, that no matter what happens in our life, it's not what happens that determines life, it's what we do with it, right? It's what we communicate and what action we take. How many buy that? Say aye. And so what we've got to be able to do then is understand maybe why we do what we do. Now, most of you know at a very basic level why you do what you do. Most of us do anyway. We know that everything we do, ultimately, we do for one of two reasons. We do it either out of our need to avoid what? Or out of our desire to gain. That's the whole game. Now, what's interesting, though, is this. You and I as human beings have a unique ability. We don't actually avoid real pain. We don't actually move towards real pleasure. We move towards what we think will equal pleasure or what we make up in our head will equal pleasure. And we avoid whatever we make up will equal pain. Like, we're unique. We're not like dogs. There isn't a clear pain and pleasure. We make stuff up. Can someone make up something that's really good for them in their mind, make it up that it's painful? Is that possible? Can a hunger striker literally starve themselves but feel pleasure instead of pain because they associate a higher moral ground to what they're doing, yes or no? Sure. I mean, you look at Nelson Mandela, of all the people I've had the privilege of meeting, people ask me all the time, like, who's the person you respect the most? By far him. Could you imagine somebody taking 27 years of your life away from you and you not want to kill everybody in sight? And then you not only don't kill anybody or come out and do anything, but you come back out and say, listen, let's rule the country together, you people that put me in jail for a quarter of a century. I mean, that shows you what a human being is capable of. And when I met him, I said, how did you make it through that suffering? I mean, how did... And he looked at me and said, what suffering? I said, well, like, 
27 years, what did you do? He said, that wasn't suffering, Tony. He said, that was preparation. He said, while I was there, I was preparing for one of two things. Either I would die and my death would spark a revolution in my country and I knew then my life's purpose would be met, or I'd get out and I'd end up running my country. So I was preparing to be a great leader. I mean, most people probably didn't have that communication with themselves. That's why you don't know Joe Smo, but you do know Nelson Mandela. Because Joe Schmo never communicated with the darn it, you know who he is. Communication is everything. Mastering that communication is everything. And we have that power. So we have the ability to decide what equals pain, what equals pleasure. But here's the problem. Most of us do act like dogs. We let other people tell us how to feel. In fact, the average American watches television seven hours a day still, even with the internet. Seven hours a day is the national average. That's it, seven, right? And what's happening there is people are being taught what to feel. And advertisers know how to get you emotional about dog food or women, women's hygiene products, right? You know, I mean, it's unbelievable what's on the news now. Plus, now they got drugs. Here's this drug. It's really wonderful, but it may not work, and it may kill you. It may give you brain hemorrhaging. It may do this. It may make you kill your best friend. But please call your doctor and see if you'd like it for you. But they play the nice music while they're saying it. It's like a Saturday Night Live commercial. Have you seen these commercials the last few years? It's like staggering the stuff they put on there. You know, you may have a brain hemorrhage. <laughs> right? Because they know how to condition you to link pleasure to things that could actually be painful. So if you don't take conscious control, if you don't have a plan for your life, I guarantee you someone else has one for it. So you better be conscious or you get to pay the price of being reactionary. ultimate success formula. What this is based upon is something very fundamental. And that is that people who succeed in any situation have a pattern of what they do to succeed. And it doesn't matter whether that person is succeeding in a business context or in a relationship context. It doesn't matter what the environment is. The fundamental lessons or laws for succeeding are very, very basic. So if we're looking for the ultimate success formula, the very first thing we have is you'd have to know what you want, which we call know your outcome. If you're going to succeed at anything, it's hard to succeed, hard to hit a target when you don't know what it is. And so it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve what you want when you haven't defined it. But this is going to become a question we're going to want you to ask yourself a lot. What is my outcome in this situation? I even have a time management system that I developed. It's really a life management system, which we call OPA, because the first O stands for what's my outcome. Because you can come up with a question like, what should I do? And you're going to end up with a long list. But as you do all these things, what will happen is you can cross something off your list and still be unfulfilled and not really achieve anything that matters. So you'll say, what's my outcome first? Then you begin to decide what you need to do to get the outcome. So in this case, we want to say, what's your outcome? You want to make it a habit to ask this question a lot. You're in the middle of a conversation. Stop yourself if it seems to go nowhere and say, what's my outcome here? Do I want to connect? Do I want to influence this person? Do I want to learn something? What's your outcome? If in the middle of that argument you were to ask yourself the question, what's my outcome here? I guarantee you your brain would say, well, my outcome is not to fight. My outcome is to resolve this. And as you get clear on what your real target is, your behavior will change automatically. So very, very few people know what they want. And the more you clear you can get about what you want, the more you can really achieve. Clarity is power. The more clear you can become about what it is you really want, the more power you're going to have. Because your brain is like a servo mechanism in a, a bomb, as an example. When they send a missile out, it has a servo mechanism. It knows what the target is. And when the target moves, it follows it. Well, your brain is very similar. When you decide exactly what it is you want, you start picking up information that you never would have picked up before consciously. For example, have you ever bought a particular car, maybe, or maybe a certain outfit? And then all of a sudden, you see that car or outfit everywhere. How many have had that experience? Say, I. Well, was that car or outfit already around you all the time? Yeah, but you didn't notice it because there's a portion of your brain that is responsible for one thing, and that is screening out 99% of what you see, hear, and feel in the life. Because if you were to notice everything that's going on in this room right now, you go start craving mad. But most of you don't. You pay attention to a small number of things. If you could right now, notice what? Millions of things. You can notice my voice. 
You could listen to what I'm saying. You could notice what's going on in the background, the screens. You could hear the air conditioning. You could smell your neighbor off to all that jumping up and down and notice that, right? You could feel maybe a little sweat trickling across your chest or whatever was going on after all that jumping up and down. You could feel the blood maybe vibrating or circulating through your left eardrum, but you don't think about those things until maybe I mention them or something triggers it. So this part of our brain that's responsible for deleting most of our thoughts and most of the things that are going on around us that part of our brain, when, you know, when it knows what you want, it makes you notice those things. You suddenly see that car because it's important. It's called the reticular activating system. For short, it's called RAS. The reticular activating system tells your brain what to pay attention to. So when you say, this is what I really want, now anything that relates to that that you wouldn't have noticed before will start popping up into your focus. And a lot of times people say, it's amazing. I decided this and it was kind of you know, synchronicity, these things started popping up. Well, these things were probably around you before, but you never noticed them because you hadn't decided your outcome. Now, when you know your outcome, you're ahead of 95% of the population, but that's not enough. The second thing you got to know is a lot of times you know your outcome, but you lose your drive. You know, you want something, but you forget the most important thing, which is know why you want it. Know why you want it. You got to know the purpose. In our OPA training system, when people are managing their lives, we have them ask, what's my outcome? And then why do I want this? Because any person successful, really successful, knows exactly what they want and they know why. The reason you're gonna know why is, remember I said yesterday, reasons come first, answers come second. If you get enough reasons, you can get a big enough why, you can figure out how to do about anything. But you gotta have purpose, because purpose provides drive. Now, if you know what you want and you know why, you're light years ahead of most of the population, but you gotta go to the step that most people seem to avoid. And that is you gotta take massive what? That's right, and the key word there is massive. Massive action can be a cure-all when you know what you're after and you know why you want it. Because when you know what you're after, when you take action, you won't just be expending energy, you'll be moving yourself in a direction towards something you really, really want. And what stops people from taking action, primarily what? Fear, and the way you get over that fear is what do you think is the number one fear most people have? failure. And the reason is they feel if they fail, they won't be loved. They'll be rejected. They'll be hurt. They'll be judged. So what they really are afraid of is losing love. And they think that this rejection, or I should say this failure, will lead to that rejection or loss of love. The truth of the matter is you can't fail unless you don't try. If you try something that doesn't work, you just learn from it, and that'll make you better the next time you go about it. Now, if you know your outcome, know why you want it, and take massive action, you're now in the most small percentile of people on the planet. So what's the next step though? Well, you can take a lot of action and get caught up in a pattern. Like become so determined that you became like tunnel vision. Like, I know this is gonna work. And so you keep running east looking for a sunset with total certainty and a lot of belief, high standards, still doesn't work. So what you have to be able to do to succeed so you don't get caught up in some old pattern is you gotta know what you're getting. Know what you are, know what you're getting. The word we use for this as for short, as we call it, sensory acuity. Sensory acuity is the idea that you want to become acutely sensitive to whether what you're doing is working or not. You don't want to just say, okay, I know what I want, I know why I want it, and I'm just going to make it happen, this is how I'm going to do it. You keep hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, doing something that doesn't work. And people do this all the time, right? Do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's called insanity. You can't do the same thing again and again, expect a different result, when you can see it doesn't get the result. But we get caught up in our patterns. So we want to get really sensitized, acutely sensitized, sensory acuity, to whether what we're doing is working or not. And by the way, sensory acuity is really the measure of a person's intelligence. What I mean by that is how do we measure intelligence? Intelligence is a measure of the number and quality of distinctions you have in a given situation. Like for example, if you talk to Eskimos, that's actually not the politically correct term anymore, I guess it's in a way. If you talk to an Inaway, what we formerly called Eskimos, you'd find out that Inaway have more than a dozen words for the word snow. More than a dozen. Now, I'm from Southern California. Guess how many words I have for snow? <laughs> One. I don't see any of it. It's called snow, baby. Right? But they got to know what kind of snow. They got to make more refined distinctions to be effective in the world to get their outcomes. They got to know what kind of snow you can build an igloo out of, what kind of snow you can take your dogs through, what kind of snow you can eat, right? What kind of snow you're going to fall through. So who has more intelligence, who has more power in that snowy environment, the Eskimo or me? Which one? Eskimo, because they have more sensory acuity. They have more refined distinctions about what each of these elements mean versus I just see it as snow. 
Now, if you took that Eskimo and you stuck him in my car in Los Angeles, then we'd find out that maybe I have a little more intelligence because he might try to steer the thing using the rearview mirror, right? He just doesn't know. So since he doesn't have that acuity, he doesn't have those distinctions, he wouldn't do terribly well there. See, some people I could hold this up and I could say, what is this? And they'd say, well, it's a cylinder. Other people say, no, no, that's a blue, white, and black cylinder. Someone else says, no, no, that's a blue color marker. A few people say, no, 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 that's not just a blue color marker. That is a pilot, super color, bride and wide color marker. And if you get it in your clothes, it'll never come out. Now, which one of those people has more power? One, two, three, or four? Four, because they have the largest number of distinctions. The thing that can affect your life the most in terms of your ability to achieve your outcomes, the greatest resource on earth is other human beings. An example, have you ever had somebody mistake your being polite for your actually being interested in what they were talking about? <laughs> or worse, how many of you have ever thought somebody was interested in what you're saying, found out later they were just being polite? How many of you in that place say, I? That's kind of an uncomfortable situation. When that happened to you, you were missing your sensory acuity that day. So now, if you know your outcome, you know why you want it. You got your purpose. You got your drive. You got your A and OPA. This is outcome, purpose, action. You know the massive action. You're taking action. And you notice if it's working. What happens if you notice it's not working? You're taking action, but it's not getting you closer to your outcome. What's the obvious fifth step? The fifth step is change your approach. Change your approach. If what you're doing, your QD says, is not working, change it. Now, what if you change your approach and that's still not working? Then what would you do? What would you do? Come on, what would you do? What if that doesn't work, what do you do? And what if that doesn't work, what do you do? What if that doesn't work, what do you do? What if after all that it still doesn't work, what do you do? And what if you try that and it doesn't work? How many times? until you find out what works. Do not say to yourself, I've tried everything. That's bull. If you tried everything, you'd have what you want. Well, I haven't tried everything, but I've tried millions of things. Millions? <laughs> Number them, name them. Well, maybe tens of thousands. Tens of thousands? Name a thousand. Well, maybe a hundred. Name a hundred. Well, maybe I did these two things over and over again that don't work, okay? But when we start saying, I've tried everything, we tend to encant that, don't we? We make it an incantation, and then we believe it. And since we think we've tried everything, we just give up. That's garbage, not true. Hey, let me ask you a question. How long would you give your average baby to learn how to walk? You know, before you shut them off and didn't let them try anymore. You know, what are you, crazy? My kid's gonna keep trying until he or she walks. Ah, magic formula. And when almost everything in the whole world walks, Right? But see, when you're a kid, that's what you do. You do whatever it takes. When you get to the adult, you try something, it doesn't work. You go, did anybody notice that? Okay, I'm never doing that again. And you lose all your power. Okay? So this is the ultimate success form. It comes down to knowing what you want, why you want it, taking massive action, know if it's working, and simply changing your approach until you get it. That's it. Anyone who succeeds does this. They may not call it Robin's ultimate success formula, but I guarantee they did it. I mean, corny example, Thomas Edison, these lights in here. Did this guy know his outcome, yes or no? He was absolutely clear without knowing the outcome. He couldn't have built that in a million years. It didn't exist before. He had to decide he wanted to create this result without the use of candles. Did he know why he wanted to do it? You bet. You read his writings. This man had a sense of incredible purpose and drive. Did he take massive action, yes or no? Oh, yes. Tens of thousands of experiments. Did he notice when it wasn't working and learn from it, yes or no? And did he keep changing his approach? That's why right now in this room we don't smell candlelight. Right? Now, if you know the old story of him, it was written about him early, in his early days. He says he's got his best friend with him. He's doing this experiment, and as he's doing it, he creates a small explosion, which shakes the room, scares both of them very, very severely. And then at the end of that, he gets up, and his friend is totally shaken, freaked out. He pulls out his journal, and he starts writing. And it's his 9,999th experiment. And his buddy says to him, what's the matter with you? Insane, you almost killed us. So you're going to wait till you have 10,000 failures before you give this stupid idea up? And Edison's response to him was, I didn't have a failure there. He goes, that's your 9,999th failure. He said, no, it's not. He said, I discovered the 9,999th way not to invent the electric light bulb. But I did discover how to create a small explosion, which may be useful in the future somewhere else. Uh, interesting, right? Because he understood what this process was. 
hey, did Bruce Springsteen use this? Do you think he just went out and used his gravelly voice and said, hey, baby, born to USA, and everybody went, yeah, you're it, man. You're the boss. You're it. Is that what happened? No. What really happened, if you know his story, was that all the agents and people who went to try and book with said, just play the guitar and keep your mouth shut. Your voice is gross sounding. It's gravelly. It's irritating. No one's going to like the stuff. Keep your mouth shut and play the guitar. But he knew what he wanted. He had all the drive you can imagine. He knew why he wanted. Took massive action. Kept changing his approach until he got what he wanted. How about uh, Sly Stallone, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky? Rocky's story is this even, right? But Sly's is too. Sly's a good friend of mine. And when I first met him years ago, he's listening to my tapes and stuff, and he invited me over for dinner, and we started talking. And I said, you know, I've heard your story from other people, but I'd really love to hear it from the horse's mouth. I don't know how much is mythology, you know, urban myth, and how much is true. So he told me his whole story. He said the essence of it, though, was he said he knew his whole life what he wanted to do since he was very, very young. He wanted to be in the movie business, period. I mean, not just TV, movies. And he, just, he said why was, for him, it was a chance to have people not only escape, but to inspire people. And by the way, that drive is what made most of his movies, inspire people to what they're capable of, to overcome unbelievable obstacles, because in his own life, he felt like he did that. When he was born, he was pulled out by the forceps. That's why he looked the way he did. That's why he talked the way he did. And he said, so I really want to do that. And he said, I knew why I want to do it, and I wasn't willing to settle for anything else. And he said, what happened was, I went out to try and get jobs, and it's not like I went, hey, Adrian, they went, you, you're a star. It didn't work out real well. They looked at me and said, hey, you're stupid looking. Do something else. You know, what is this talking like this? There's no place for you in that stuff. You're never going to be a star in the movies. You're insane. No one's going to want to listen to somebody who looks dopey and talks out of the side of their mouth, right? And he got no after no after no after no. He said, I was thrown out more, more than 1,500 times of agents offices in New York. I said, there aren't 1,500 agents in New York. He said, I know. I've been to them five, six, seven, eight, nine times. He said, I remember one guy I went in there and I got in there at four o'clock and he wouldn't see me, so I stayed there, and I would not leave, and I stayed overnight. They came back the next morning, I was still sitting there. He said, that's how I got my first job. The guy said, fine, come in here. And he sat down, and he went through this, and he gave my first movie. I said, oh, really? I thought Rocky was the first movie. He said, no, this other movie, I'd never heard of it. He said, I said, well, what character did you play? He said, well, I was in it for about 20 seconds. I was a thug that somebody beat up. He said, because they made me feel like, you know, somebody, people hate your guts. You getting beat up, it'll be a good thing. And he did like three movies like that. Never got anything. Kept going out. Rejection, rejection, rejection. So finally he realized it wasn't working. So he changed his approach. He said, I was starving, by the way. He said, I couldn't pay for even to have heat in my apartment. My wife was screaming at me every day to go get a job. I said, well, why didn't you? He said, because I knew that if I got a job, he said, I'd get seduced back and I'd lose my hunger. He said, I knew that the only way I could do this is if it was the only choice, if I burned all other bridges. Because if I did a normal job, pretty soon I'd be caught up in that rhythm and that stuff, and I'd feel okay about my life, and I feel like my dream would just gradually disappear. And he said, I wanted to keep that hunger. That hunger was the only thing I thought was my advantage. He said, my wife didn't understand that at all. And he said, we'd have these vicious fights. And he said, it was freezing. So I was broke. We had no money. And he said, so I finally went to the public library one day because it was warm. He said, I didn't want to read anything. He says, I went in, New York Public Library. He said, I was hanging out there, and I sat down in this chair, and somebody left a book there. And he said, I, I looked down at this book, and it were the poems of Edgar Allan, stories of Edgar Allan Poe. And he said, so I started reading it, and he said, I got totally into Edgar Allan Poe. And he said, I know everything about it. He goes on for another 20 minutes telling me about Edgar Allan Poe. He knows everything, how he died, what it was about, what really happened. And I said, well, what did Poe do for you? He said, Poe got me out of myself. He got me to think about how I could touch other people and not worry about myself so much. And he said, it made me decide to become a writer. I said, just imagine Rocky the writer, right? And he said, so I tried to write a bunch of screenplays. Nothing worked, nothing worked. I was totally broke. He said, I didn't even have 50 bucks. And he said, and finally, he said, I sold a script. And it was called Paradise Alley. He said, it's a movie I made many years later, but I sold it. And he said, I sold it for 100 bucks. He said, but 100 bucks was a ton of money, man. I was so thrilled. And I thought, I'm on my way. But it never led to anything. And he said, so finally, he said, I kept going and going and going. He said, finally, we were so broke. He said, I hawked my wife's jewelry. He said, Tony, there's some things in life you should never do. <laughs> he said, that was basically the end of our relationship. She hated my guts so much. He said, now we were so broke, we had nothing, no food, no money. And he said, the one thing I love most in the world was my dog. He said, I love my dog because he gave me unconditional love, unlike my wife. And he said, so what happened was, though, we were so broke that to survive, I couldn't even feed my dog. So I went to a liquor store. He said, it was the lowest day of my life. And I stood outside the liquor store trying to sell my dog to strangers. 
He said, I tried to sell my dog for 50 bucks. And he said, this, finally, this one guy negotiated with me and bought my dog for me, my best friend on earth, for $25. He said, I walked away from there and I cried. He said, it was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. He said, two weeks later, I'm watching a fight between Muhammad Ali and Weppner, this white guy that's getting bludgeoned but just keeps on coming. And he said, I got an idea. He said, I, as soon as the fight ended, I started writing. He said, I wrote for 20 straight hours. I did not sleep. I wrote the entire movie in 20 hours straight. Right then, saw the fight, wrote the movie, whole thing, done. He said, I was shaking at the end. I was so excited. He said, I really knew, man. I knew what I wanted. I knew why I wanted it. He said, just like you teach that formula. He said, but I said, man, I took the action. Now it's time to deliver. And so he said, I went out and started trying to sell it to agents. And they all would read it and they'd say, you know, this is predictable. This is stupid. This is sappy. He said, I wrote down all the things they said, and I read them the night of the Oscars when we won. Right? He said, it was really good, right? So the greatest revenge is massive success. <laughs> and he said, so what happened was, he said, I kept going, trying to sell it, trying to sell it, nobody going, I'm broke, I'm starving. He said, finally, I meet these guys, they read it, and they believe in the script, and they love it. And they offer me $125,000 for my script. I said, oh my God, you must have been out of your mind. He said, I was. I said, just one thing though, guys, you got a deal based on one thing. And they said, what's that? He said, I got a star in it. They went, Pff. what are you talking about? You're a writer. He said, no, no, I'm an actor. He said, no, 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 you're a writer. He said, no, no, I'm an actor. That is my story and I'm Rocky. He said, I got to play it. You know, I got to be the head person. I got to be the starring role. And they said, there's no way. We're not going to pay you $125,000, take some no name and stick you in that and throw our money away. We need a star. You know, and they want to have Ryan O'Neal play Rocky to give you a picture. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's who they picked, right? And so he said, no way, Ryan O'Neal isn't Rocky. I'm Rocky. Went through this whole thing, right? They finally, he said, they said, well, take it or leave it. He said, I left the room. I said, if that's what you believe, you don't get my script. And he left. Here's a man with no money, none, totally broke, offered $125,000, more money than seen in his lifetime. And he walked away because he knew his real what? Knew his real what? And why he wanted, he was committed to it. So he said they called him a few weeks later and they came and brought him back and they offered him a quarter of a million dollars not to star in his own movie. He turned it down, $250,000. They came back, their final offer was $325,000. They wanted this thing. He said, not without me, and they said no. They finally compromised and they gave him $35,000 and points in the movie, because they said, if this is gonna happen, then you're gonna take the risk with us. And the bottom line is, we don't think it'll work, but at least we won't spend a bunch of money on you. And they only spent a million dollars to make Rocky, and it grossed $200 million at the time. I, I mean, it was done pretty well. But what's interesting about this is, here's, I said, what'd you do? I mean, even 35,000, it's not a quarter of a million. That's a lot of money when you don't have 25 bucks. I said, what's the first thing you did? I figured you went out and partied or something. He said, I went to that liquor store for three straight days and hoped that the man who had my dog frequented the store. He said, because I want to buy back my dog. I thought that was so cool, right? That was really cool. I said, what happened? He said, third day I was there, this guy walks by and I see him and I can't believe it. And there's my dog. And I looked at him and I said, sir, remember me? And he said, it had been about a month and a half by the time this had all come about. And he said, remember me? You know, I'm the guy that sold you the dog. I goes, yeah, yeah, I love the dog. He said, well, look. He said, I was so broke. I was starving. He's my best friend. I'm sure you love him too, but I got to have him black. Please, I beg of you. He said, I'll pay you $100 for the dog. I know you paid me $25, but I'll give you $100. And the man said, absolutely not. No way. He's my dog now. You can't buy him back, right? And Sly said, you know, Tony, you know how you say, know your outcome? I said, yeah. He said, I knew it. And he said, I kept changing my approach. So I went $500 for the dog. The guy said, absolutely no way. He said, $1,000 for my dog. The guy said, no amount of money on earth is ever going to get this dog from you. I said, what'd you do? He said, I knew my outcome, right? Because he listened to these tapes, kept to him. He said, I decided to take massive action. He said, I got my dog. I just kept changing my approach, so I got it. I said, what'd it cost you? $15,000 and a part in Rocky. The guy's in Rocky. You know that dog in Rocky, Butt Kiss? That's Sly's real dog, right? That's the dog. He bought him back. So, so he put his dog in the movie, and he put the guy in the movie and paid 15 grand while well, he had 35,000. Isn't that pretty cool? Pretty awesome. So there's always a way, if you're committed, 
Just got to keep changing your approach. Now, let me offer you, there's going to be so many things we're going to cover and we're going to do that in order for you to be able to really retain it, your brain needs kind of some triggers, some triggers that will remind you of the basic content of this. So you might want to write these four words down. The first word is the word perception. Perception. This is a core principle of life. And that principle is simple. Whatever you perceive is going to be true for you. Whatever you perceive is going to be true for you, so you better control your perceptions. Don't let your perceptions be controlled by others. And we're going to learn lots of ways to change our perceptions and therefore immediately change the way we feel, the way we behave, the way we think. You know, if somebody believes, perceives, that the witch doctor has pointed at them and put a hex on them and they're going to die of a heart attack, when a person believes that with certainty, they give an unquestioned command to their body and their heart stops. Happens in all the cultures of the world. That's the power of perception. Perception can make you feel euphoric or it can make you feel depressed about the same thing. It just has to do with how you structure perception. Most of us are running around allowing our perceptions to be shaped by others or shaped by old scripts, old dialogues, old belief structures that we never really consciously designed and we're paying the price for them. So one of the things we're going to do is show you a variety of ways of changing perception. Another key word for your file cabinet is going to be the word physiology. And when you change your physiology, it changes your perception. So this is huge leverage. It is the great gift your creator has given you. Most of us have not consciously used our physiology effectively. We want to do that. And you might want to notice right now because you have a lot of old habits. Old habits are you sit in a chair with a notebook and you go into a deep trance. Now one way, one important way to keep your physiology up besides breathing and being up is to yell back the answers to what we're talking about because that'll keep you in what we call uptime. Uptime is where your mind is fully active. It's easy to be passive, but if you have to communicate out loud, that's why I ask you to do that, it'll keep you up there. So you want to do that, yes or no? Yes. Outstanding. Third key word is the word rapport. Rapport. Rapport offers you a really simple distinction, and that is anything, anything you want to achieve in your life, anything you want to learn, any skill you want to master, anything you want to see or do or experience or have. There's somebody else out there in the world who can help you do it more rapidly, more effectively, if, you just, if they wanted to help you, that is. But no one's going to want to help you unless you first help them to get what they really want. You're never going to know what they really want unless you first develop a relationship of rapport, a relationship of total responsiveness with that person. So we're going to show you a variety of ways to have to get rapport all the way down to sitting next to a stranger and again, feeling what they're feeling without them even talking. And then lastly is the word strategy. Strategy. And a strategy is a consistent way to get a result. Once you know the strategy for something, you get the result again and again and again and again. It's no longer a question, can you get the result? You can do it at will, as often as you want. And there are all kinds of strategies. Most of our strategies are unconscious in nature. For example, if you've ever been like feeling really creative and things are flowing through you, if that's happened more than once in your life, you have a strategy for being creative. Here's the problem. You don't know what it is. So hopefully the environment triggers you to feel that creativity. But once you know what the strategy is, you can get yourself creative on call in a millisecond for the rest of your life. In life, you're not competing with everybody. It's so much easier than that. So few people even know that have not even decided that they're going to win the game. And if you don't have enough reasons to follow through on it, nothing else is going to help you. And so this is a good metaphor because games are a reflection of life. The way you play a game very often is how you play life. Not absolutely, but very often what most of you do is you get in the game and you don't decide on what the outcome is and you start playing. Or you get in the game, you know the outcome, you don't decide to win. Well, it's not that important. Maybe life is. Maybe giving your all is what the important thing is, not whether you win or not. If you decide to win, you're going to have to give your all. If you decide just to play, you don't have to. There's a strategy for most things in life. There's a way to really win in your relationships. There's a way to really win financially every time, long term. There's a way to win in any area if you know what the strategy is. Nightingale Conan is proud to present Unleash the Power Within, an exciting live audio seminar by Tony Robbins. Think of a change in your own life, or maybe someone you know, that was really hard for you to make. 
like really hard. You kept trying to change, kept trying to change, never followed through. And finally one day, wham, he said, that's it. No more. Never again. It's over. You're about to participate in a groundbreaking audio seminar by Tony Robbins, the world's leading expert on the psychology of peak performance and human potential. Recorded live at Tony's life-transforming Unleash the Power Within weekend, you'll experience the essence of the Tony Robbins experience, a powerful, high-energy examination of your life and its grand possibilities. At the end of your life, I don't think you're going to remember all the experiences of your life. I just don't. I think you'll remember certain moments. And you can create them, or you can hope they show up every once in a while. Rarely does the quality of life just happen. It must be created and constructed with conscious thought, caring, and desire. That's what makes a great life. Tony has spent over 20 years sharpening his life-enhancing strategies while coaching people around the world. Unleash the Power Within is the culmination of all he's learned and the tools that you need to make your life extraordinary. His dynamic powerhouse style, combined with his empathic approach to human transformation, have made Tony Robbins America's results coach and a world-class leader of profound sensitivity and insight. So this is the ultimate success form. It comes down to knowing what you want, why you want it, take a massive action, know what's working, and that's it. Anyone who succeeds does this. Take a front row seat for Tony Robbins' Unleash the Power Within. You'll learn to immediately break through your self-imposed limitations, create lasting change, and condition your mind for a lifetime of constant and never-ending fulfillment. There's so much in our lives that we can do. We could all be up at 6 a.m. with total passion for living. We could all be as fit and healthy and as strong as we can imagine. We all have the capability for that. We could all have the impact on our friends and our kids and our families that we want to have. We could also be happy every single day. We could. It's not impossible. The problem is our belief systems keep us from actually engaging the parts of us that would make that a must and not a should. Because we all got lots of shoulds, right? I should do this, I should do that, I should go on a diet, I should follow through, I should spend more time, I should make that extra call, but we don't actually do it, we just what I call should all over ourselves, basically. <laughs> and so we want to turn those shoulds into musts, and anybody can do that. How many of you have had an experience where in a moment, something you've been working on for years, or struggled with for months, you just like nothing worked, and all of a sudden, wham, I mean, you just, something happened, you said, that is it, never again, no more, and you made the shift in a relationship, in your business, in your career, someplace in life. How many can relate to this? Say, I. This is really the beginning of a journey. And it's a journey that I can promise you will be one you won't forget. Not because I'm so great, but because you got all these things inside of you. If you came here for me to be your guru, you came to the wrong place. Because that's not what I'm about. I'm just a guy. I have some really good solutions to ideas because for two decades of my life, 21 years now, it's been my obsession. What makes people what they do what they do and how do you change it quickly when what they're doing is not what they want? How do you produce results? And I've been now with, you know, about two million people from 65 countries, so you don't have to be too smart over two decades of that many patterns to start seeing there are patterns in human behavior and they're predictable patterns. And when you know what they are, you can change things in lightning-like speed, just like your mechanic knows how to fix your car, hopefully, or your computer expert pretends that they know the answer to that. <laughs> Each one of you have your focus. You have an area of your life that you know much more than I do, and you're an expert in that area. So I'm not coming to you this weekend as having all the answers, but I've got some that work just because they work globally, meaning worldwide, no matter what your background is, what your past experience is, your gender, your color, your religious beliefs. There are certain fundamental laws of the human psyche and the human physiology that when you engage them, you will get results, period. In fact, I got a question for you. How many of you in this room have ever gone to an educational experience of any sort, a seminar, university experience, anything, you learn something you really thought was valuable, I mean, you really truly knew it was valuable, but then you never actually applied what it is you learned. How many have had this experience? Say, I. I. How many have had this happen to you more than once in your lifetime? Say, I. I. How many still feel like you're intelligent? Say, I. How is it that an intelligent person like you and I could learn something more than once, know it's valuable, and then never use it? Well, the answer is because we've all been taught a big lie. The lie is that information is power. Information is not power. Information is potential power. Only one thing gives you power, and that's action. But I want to tell you right now, I don't believe in positive thinking. Positive thinking says, go to your garden and say, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. Okay? 
I got news for you, buddy. There are weeds there and they're going to take your garden. Okay? So I'm not one of those positive thinking people. I want you to be clear about that. I believe in intelligence. Intelligence says this. Number one, see it as it is, but don't see it worse than it is, which is what most people do out of fear. Most people are so afraid of being disappointed again that they say they're skeptical or they're pessimistic. When someone says they're skeptical or pessimistic, you can translate that real quickly as, I'm fearful. I'm afraid to get hurt. I'm afraid to get my hopes up. I'm afraid to try again. I'm afraid to go through the disappointment. I'm afraid of what other people say if I don't look good and it doesn't work out well. I'm afraid to fail. That's pessimism. That's skepticism. Courage means you got to see it as it is, but you also, step two, got to see it better than it is. You got to know how really it is, but then you got to get a vision for what you want. There's a great book called The Good Book that says, without a vision, people perish. And you know what? We all have to have a compelling vision, a compelling future. How many of you know exactly what you want in your life? How many have no clue? <laughs> Where are the rest of you people? Kind of in between? Well, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> On the cusp, are you? <laughs> right? So we're going to help you develop what is that compelling future. But you got to see it is. You got to see it better than it is. And then you got to make it the way you see it. And the way I'm going to show you how to do that is really fundamental. It requires three things I've mentioned. Number one, you want to change your life? There's only one way. You've got to raise your standards. And I know that sounds unbelievably stupid and simplistic, but it is the only way in which a person's life changes. What does it mean to change your standards? It means you have to take the shoulds in your life and make them musts. Because as long as it's a should, you'll do it when it's convenient, and convenience does not create consistency. And if you're good at anything, you're consistent. If you've got a great relationship, it's not because once in a while you show up and are passionate and loving. It's consistency that makes a relationship work. It's consistency that will give you financial independence, not being good for a while with your investments or being good for a while in your earnings. It's consistency. And the only way to get that is to have a standard, a must. And people, all of us in this room right now, have exactly what we must have. You say, no, Tony, I'm struggling. I don't have what I must have. Trust me, I must have a better relationship than this. I must have more money than this. I must have less weight on my body than I got right now. Trust me, it's a must. No. Not yet, unless you're in the process, unless you really are making progress, the answer is no, it's still a should. And so what we gotta do is get it to a must. And when it's a must, everything in life changes. Michael Jordan, great example. And one of the things that's neat about Michael is if you ask Michael, you know, what is it that separates you from everybody else? What's made you the best that exists? He's very humble, really warm, and he's, thanks for the comment. And I say, you know, is it talent? Is it ability? Is it God-given gifts? I mean, what is it? And Michael will tell you, he said, Tony, no one has a higher demand on themselves than I have on me. He said, I don't compete with other people. I compete with what my best could possibly be. Because if I competed with other people, then I'm only going to push myself so hard. His standard is really simple. He modeled it from a man named Dr. J. Dr. J in his day was probably the best player of the league. He had a simple philosophy. Dr. J came, somebody came to him when he was in his mid-30s, uh, and they said to him, Dr. J, how come you're so darn good? How come you're so lucky to have all these skills? And Dr. J was a very cool guy. He never got upset. But he also got a little heated, and he said, let me tell you why I'm this way. Because every day since I was seven years old, I've demanded more from myself than anyone else could possibly expect. I thought, isn't that interesting? If every day you demanded more from yourself than anyone else could expect of you, if it wasn't the standards of what other people think, but it was the standards of what you were capable of, if that was the must for you, not the should, then would you eat differently today? If it, you had to be that great every day in your relationship, even though you're exhausted and tired, you're going to go home and be that passionate, that committed. If that was a must to be your absolute best every single day, to have a higher demand on yourself than your spouse, boyfriend, or girlfriend could ever imagine. If that was your standard for yourself, how would you show up on a daily basis in your relationship? What would your relationship look like? You could take that any area of your life. But people the best have those standards. Most of us wait for life to give us the have to's. It's like if you don't push yourself, you don't stretch yourself, then God shows up and says, you need a little growth and provides it to you in a way you probably won't find very pleasant. So I believe in raising my own standards so hopefully God doesn't have to step in too many times with me. Right? Maybe God just gives me the opportunity and I can make some intelligent choices. Second thing that all people do who get what they really want, who expand and have a quality of life, is they change their limiting beliefs. Because the only thing keeping you from getting what you really want really is the belief that you can't have it even though you say you think you can't. The unconscious belief. The belief inside of you that says, oh yeah, I can do this, and this voice inside says, who are you kidding? We're going to give you a few skills on how to get your beliefs aligned. Have you ever been in a place where you were so focused, it was like you and the task at hand, and there was nothing else in the world but what you were committed to? Bombs could be going off, you wouldn't know about it. How many of you have ever been in that place? I call it a genius state. How many have been there? Say, I. 
Okay, that's the state you're going to get yourself into. Absolute certainty. The bottom line is, what you're thinking about in this moment is controlled by your beliefs and your values, the way you've been raised, right? But many of you never chose those consciously. You just kind of pick this stuff along the way and it affects your life. So we're going to decide consciously. And we're not only going to destroy what doesn't work, you're going to install what you need. And when your beliefs are on track, when your values are on track, you are pulled in the direction you want instead of being pulled apart. You ever been in that place? It's like you want two things that are totally in conflict? I'll show you how to resolve that. And that'll be a huge, huge shift for most of you. And then the third thing you need to really make your life work besides incredibly high what? Uh-oh, we're in deep trouble already, I can see. <laughs> really high what? That's right, you gotta raise your standard, whatever it is. It's gotta be the next level of standards for you. You can't get to the next level of your life with the same level of thinking, with the same level of standards as you have right now in this moment. So I could give you a million skills, give you all the ability, you get pumped out of your mind, leave here, and unless it's a must for you, you'll go back to doing the same stuff. You know, you have like a nice month or two of like riding high on the float of the seminar, but I'm gonna seeing permanent, lasting change. And the only way you do that is get enough leverage on yourself that change is a must, and once you change it, it's so reinforcing, you stick with it. Not because you're so disciplined, but because it's so rewarding. Then the third thing you gotta have is the right strategy. Because it's one thing to have a high standard, like you go, I'm gonna go out and change the world. That's my must. And then your voice inside goes, who are you kidding? And you got a problem. But let's say you got the standard and the belief. And let's say your goal is to see a sunset and your strategy is start running east looking for a sunset. I don't care how much you believe, you got a problem. You gotta have the right strategy. Strategies for overcoming fear, strategies for taking action, strategies for attraction, causing attraction to happen to another person towards you and vice versa. Strategies for feeling love, strategies for making decisions, strategies for creating rapport, things that work. Why do they work? Why is it a strategy? It's proven. Because people of all directions, backgrounds, genders, all can do the same result. It's a strategy when anyone can do it, as long as they do it that way. It's like a recipe. Once you know it, you create the same result as often as you want. But you've got to have the right strategy, or you can work real hard and be a really good person and be a real hard worker and still have nothing. And most people have this in lots of areas of their life. Their financial life is an obvious example. You know, 95% of this population ends up dead broke or dead by age 65. Why? They don't have the right strategy. And they have low standards and they don't believe. But some of them even have those two, but they don't have the strategy. So we're going to work on all three of those elements. Does that make sense? Let me offer you a possibility. We know you've learned from the past and not done it. Why? Why is because all this information came at you. But as I said to you, information doesn't change your life. We live in the information age, supposedly. There's too much information. You can't possibly absorb it to you. Where's it coming from? Everywhere, right? right? It's coming from CD-ROMs and pretty soon DVDs for many of you. And it's on the internet. We are drowning information and we're starving for wisdom. We're starving for those things we can actually use to actually get what we really want. Otherwise, you can spend all your time on the internet reading more information or chatting or buying something and never have any change of life. The internet's not going to make your life better. You have to make your life better by using your resources differently. But here's the deal. We're not in the information age. We're in the entertainment age. Here's what really grabs us, something that moves us emotionally. We don't remember all that information. When something grabs us, man, we remember. Some of you old enough to be around long enough to know this, remember where you were when you heard John F. Kennedy was shot. Right? For some of you, maybe it was John Lennon if he was an associated hero for you. For others of you, it's, you know, you remember everything about Monica Lewinsky. By the way, she's now just Monica. You know, it's like Oprah, right? Michael, right? It's now Monica. Everybody on earth knows who Monica is, right? There's an emotion, right? There's a feeling. There's something there. It's not the information that's getting you, right? O.J. Simpson was the big focus before that. Why were people watching every single day? Drama, entertainment, emotion, feeling. So the only reason, the only reason people pay attention though, when we get something is you add feeling to it. So here's my goal with you. I don't want this to be a class. We're going to try something different. We're going to go into 21st century learning. See, this was designed for you to obey, to enter the 20th century where your job was working in an industrial complex of some sort, maybe building cars or something. And so they trained you from birth that you'd arrive on time, check in, do what you're supposed to do, and sit and shut up till someone told you what to do, and then you only did what they told you to do, and you didn't talk to your neighbor. Now today in business, if you don't talk to your neighbor, you're out of business, right? Today, if you wait for somebody to tell you what to do, you're in trouble. I mean, today you gotta think, you're in teams, you gotta make it happen, you gotta create it, you got your own business. It's a different world. So this has trained us for a world we're not in. So we have to be in a proactive, aggressive, entertainment-driven, emotional world. That's where we are. That's what you want. 
It's the only way to get that is to learn in that state. So this is gonna be very different for most of you. I'm gonna ask you not to be the passive, deep trance hypnotic subjects. I'm gonna ask you to be outrageous, playful, crazy, silly, and fun. If you and I are gonna be effective as people, which means have fun, be fulfilled, be passionate, get results, achieve, learn, grow, all that, then we've gotta become active rather than passive in our experience. In order to do that, it starts with the way we move and the way we think. And so I have a metaphor for myself. I think the most influential people in the world are kids. How many of you have kids? How many of you ever tried to say, no, you can't have an ice cream cone to a kid and saw moves you've never seen in your life before? <laughs> right? They don't hear no, it goes right on by. So if we want a quality life, one thing's for sure, we've got to become people of influence. You've got to be influenced your kids and your family and yourself. You've got to get yourself to do what's necessary. I mean, influence is the base skill for quality life. Influence with integrity. So if you're going to influence yourself, then you might look at kids because they're good at influencing. And they do it a lot of ways. They do it with their energy, don't they? They do it with playfulness. They do it by asking a gazillion questions. They do it because they're having so much fun that even when they annoy you, they make you laugh every bit, right? Somehow they pull it off. And so my view is I'm always going to be a kid, no matter what age I am. Because kid or adult or old person is all a mindset. I know a man who's 84 years old who has just started lifting weights about six years ago, now lifts bench presses 450 pounds. I mean, unbelievable. This guy is like pure stud, right? And there's all kinds of research showing now about people starting in their 60s and 70s start lifting weights and get as strong as men and women in their 20s and 30s. And his mind is the best part, though. That's why he does it. I mean, sure, anybody could learn to do that. But most people don't have that as a standard. I mean, come on. We're all in cultural hypnosis. I mean, when you're in your 60s, it's over, baby. Right? You're getting old. Baby boomers start freaking when they hear those kinds of things. Right? They go, wait a second, I'm in my 50s now. I'm in my late 40s. I'm going to defy all that stuff. Right? But they don't, most people in their 60s and 70s don't have that as their standard saying, I'm going to learn to bench press 450 pounds, so they don't. It's a should. It's not even a should. It's a never maybe. They don't have any belief that it's possible, any sense of certainty, and they have no strategy. He had all three. I also know a young man I was talking to you recently, he's 21 years old, who's got, he's probably the oldest person I've ever met in my life because everything is impossible for him and he's tired all the time and he can't accomplish anything and the world is forever terrible. That's, it's, it's a mindset, isn't it? How many want to be a kid for a few days here? Say, I. Okay, then if you want to do that, here are a couple ways to do it. Number one, when I ask you a question, yell back the answer. Not so we have a rah-rah session here, but because research shows if you sit and listen to me passively, within four weeks you'll remember 10% of what I said. If you listen and take some notes, jumps up into the 50 percentiles. If you listen, take notes, but physically you're active, like you yell back the answer, your attention is in the 90 to 95 percentiles because what happens is like when you yell an answer back, it's like driving, driving the grooves of what you learn deeper inside of you. Plus, you're going to know the answer to anything I ask you. I'm only going to ask you questions you know the answer to because I want to help you to have strong self-esteem. <laughs> it's easy stuff, but by yelling yes, you'll also keep your energy high. How many want to do this, especially when you don't feel like it, so you build some emotional muscle? Do you agree with me that if you really want an extraordinary quality of life, that one of the things you've got to master is your ability to get yourself to take action, to influence yourself, number one? How many agree with that? Say, I. Ah. How many agree, number two, you'd have to become good at influencing others with integrity, meaning getting people to do the things they normally won't do for themselves? How many agree with that? Say, I. Ah. Outstanding. So if influence is a skill, it starts in the first moments of human communication or connection. So I want you to try something silly. I want you to notice little things, you know, most people think little things don't matter. They want to see the big thing. But I have a different mindset. When someone negotiates a deal that changes planet Earth, like, you know, Gorbachev and Reagan get together, and for the first time in human history, you destroy nuclear bombs, I want to know what caused that. And everybody looks at the big thing. But I get together, and I've had the privilege of being with both those guys, and I found out exactly from them what was the little thing. They didn't even notice at the time. Like later on in retrospect, they figured out what actually made them become friends, actually made them make an agreement. Little things change everything. If you're heading this direction, and we make a little 10-degree shift, it looks like nothing, you know, 10 degrees between these two. But if you take that 10-degree shift out a week from now, a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, you have a revolution. You have a totally different destination in where your life turns up. Because it's so much easier to change the little things when you're way upstream. It's like I have a simple philosophy. Kill the monster while it's little, when it's a baby. <laughs> Don't wait till it's eating the city before you kill the monster. Okay? And we all have little monsters inside that we want to handle. We also have some real great things that we want to magnify.
One of the things that changes your life is when you think you've hit your highest standard, what makes life never the same again is when you literally decide that there is a higher standard for you. When you decide there is more. And that's a conscious decision. You see it in an athlete when there's nothing physically left inside of them, it appears, and, it, and no one else expects it from them, and they reach down inside and they step up, right, to the challenge. And you can just see it. It's determination, right? It's will. It's faith. It's courage. It's passion. It's when you reach down and you find something more inside of you. And by the way, that's where all the juice is. That's what you all came here for, whether you tell me that or not. I know that's what you really want. You may have other ways of languaging what you want, but what you're hoping for are those core feelings. But those core feelings are things you can have in a heartbeat. You just must exert them. But it starts with even the way you move. So I want you to think about constantly raising the standard because if you in life are in a position where you do a poor job at something, and that's your standard, like, you know, on a regular basis, you're pretty, you don't really, you don't even do a good job. You're pretty poor at it. In life, you do a poor job. What kind of rewards do you get for a poor job? Poor. That's what I used to think, too. I used to think if you did a poor job, you got poor rewards. Seemed to make sense. That's not how life is rigged. You do a poor job, you get no rewards. You do a poor job, you get the door. Poor job too often, you're out of here. You get downsized, right-sized, outsourced. Isn't that true? You do a poor job in a relationship, it's, that person's not going to stick around. You do a poor job with your kids, they end up in jail. Poor equals pain. Poor, there are no rewards for poor. It's not an equal deal. You do a poor job, you get a poor reward. Wrong. Let's say that standard's way down here. Now, the next level of standards would be a huge jump way up here to something called good. Now, when you do a good job at something, what kind of rewards do you get? Some of you say, good. No, I used to think that too. You do a good job, you get good rewards. Wrong. I'll tell you the most scary thing that happens to me every day in my life. I get stopped every single day by at least a dozen people. And they come up and they either tell me incredible stories about their life has changed, they'll say something like, Mr. Robbins, and they're really serious. And you can see there's some pain. They go, you know, I watched you on TV and I thought, if I ever met you, I might ask you this question. They'll ask me a question something like, I'm really a good man. How come my wife left me? Or, and it's heartbreaking. Or she'll say, I'm really a good wife. How come my husband left me? Or I'm really, I care about my kids. How come they hate me? How come my kids are on cocaine? And it tears me up inside because I care so much about people. And it, you can't tell them what the truth is. The truth is you did a good job. And that's the problem. That's the problem. Because when you do a good job, what kind of rewards you get? Poor. So the bottom line is, most people here are really trying to do a good job. And most people are really good. You know, they're really good. I was a good man and I was fat, and I was overweight, and in the emotional sense, I was broke. Financially, I was broke. Spiritually, I was wiped out, and I was a good guy. But, and I was so frustrated because I said, I'm good. You got to know, good's not good enough. Now, I know none of you would settle for good. You wouldn't come here. You're all overachievers, right? So poor is not even in the realm of your possibility. Good, this big jump here, you go, that's for wusses. You guys here are ultimate achievers. You're way up here with a thing called excellence, am I right? That's what I thought. How many here are committed to excellence? Say I. I. Outstanding. When you do an excellent job at something, what kind of rewards do you get? Good. Good. And you know what? It really annoys you too, doesn't it? Because most people go, wait a second. I mean, have you ever done this? Ever achieved a goal, man? You went for it. You achieved it, man. You made it happen. And then you went, is this all there is? How many have been in that place? And it's kind of like a depressing moment, isn't it? Because you worked so hard for it, you achieved the goal, and you're still not happy. That's because you were really excellent. See, excellence is like you're like one of the best. You know, excellence is you really do, you know, an excellent job. I mean, you're not just good, and you're certainly not poor. For God's sakes, you should have bigger rewards emotionally or financially or in your career or in your relationship for being excellent. Nope. You go, oh, I don't have anything left. There's nothing left to me. I've given my all. Nope. You're not giving your all. There's that little piece you haven't got to that if you get to it, you get all the rewards. Because if this is poor, huge jump to good, huge jump to excellence, here's the good news. All the rewards are at the next level. And they're disproportionate. I mean, they're like way beyond what you can imagine. And the good news is they're about this much higher than excellence. At a level right there, right? Right there. And that level, hallelujah. Feels like, a, feels like a sermon at this point, right? That level right here that's just a, a few inches above is called outstanding. And when you 
are outstanding, when you stand out from all the rest, in your courage, in your commitment, in your persistence, in your love, in your dedication, in your skill set, in your whatever, you get all the rewards. And it's unfair, really, because you're only a little bit better than those people that are excellent, but your rewards are like a gazillion amount. It's just being outstanding on a consistent basis instead of being excellent. And that difference, by the way, is not usually really a large skill difference. It's a psychology difference. It's a standard difference. It's what you hold yourself to. I mean, did you watch the opening to the Olympics in Atlanta? When this guy walked out, I don't know if you remember, how many, how many saw the opening to the Olympics? And this little guy walks out, he's 97 years old. He's the oldest living gold medalist. And he walks out into the field and what happens? 100,000 people in the stadium stand up and clap. The president cried. I mean, why? They don't even know who this guy is. Because they know he was outstanding probably 40, 50, 60 years ago. Unbelievable. Think about it, 70 years ago. That's what we value outstanding in a culture. A good example is Carrie Strug. Now, this little girl, remember what happened? This little girl gets hurt, injured. And it's, it's like a movie, right? It's like a Rocky movie all encapsulated. Because you're watching, it's like the Americans finally look like for the first time they're going to be able to finally win, finally beat the Russians. And sure enough, all of a sudden this girl wrecks her leg. And as she does it, everybody's like, oh my God, it's over. It can't happen. There she goes, holds it in. And what happens? She goes away. Everybody's there. And all of a sudden the monitor comes in and goes, my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. she's standing up. She's walking towards the mat. She couldn't. She can't. It couldn't be. She's not going to try it, is she? And the whole place gets really dramatic and quiet. And this little girl with nothing but guts and heart, through the pain, goes and lands. Holds just long enough, pulls that leg up, and everybody goes crazy. They win the gold medal. How many of you cried? Come on. You cried out there. Come on. And you don't even know this girl. If you felt the emotion in that moment, if you cried or you felt celebratory, there's only one reason why. Because in that moment, you recognize the part of you. That's what made you feel moved. You know there's a part of you that's outstanding. If you cried, it may have been that you're not fully utilizing that part of you, and you realize that. If you felt celebratory, maybe you just for a moment remember what it would feel like if you engaged that part of you. But that only happens by a decision, because it wasn't skill that made her win. It was heart. And that's something you have total control of. If you'll push yourself beyond anything you thought was available, and like lifting a weight, like, I mean, how do you build a bicep? How do you do it? What do you got to do? You got to demand. You got to put a huge demand on it consistently, don't you? You have to take away. You can exercise it. If you don't exercise it, it atrophies. But to grow a muscle, like really build it, you got to take on something that's much harder, much more uncomfortable, not what you plan for, not what's comfortable for you. And if you make yourself do it, even though it's uncomfortable, and you do it again and again, you get growth because as you make a demand, the muscle expands. So it is true with a muscle called passion. The more you demand of it, the more it'll expand. But if you just do what you're already comfortable with, you'll leave here kind of pumped up, feeling good, and you'll say, wasn't that a cool seminar? But your life won't be changed. You'll have had a great weekend that'll last a month or so. That's not why I came by. I really want to see you give yourself the gift of raising the standard. By the way, if I'm going to do 10 curls, which one of those 10 gives me, which one of those 10 do I want to do the least, probably? Which one? Number 10. Which one gives you all the growth? A number 11. Good people do 10 when 10 is what's asked of them. Excellent people usually 10 and a little half. Outstanding people always do more than is expected of them because they're not doing it for someone else. They're doing it for what they know they're capable of. It's when you feel like you don't have an ounce left and you make yourself do it when all of your life has changed. So imagine you've come to the mental, emotional, and spiritual gym. I'm not here to tell you what to believe religiously in any way. I have no conversation for you there. I am respectful of whatever you believe. Whatever you believe, I'd say practice it. But spirituality is not just religion. It's the way you live your life. So if you entered the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual gym, then what you'd be here to do is to push yourself harder than ever before. Because if you go in that gym and just kind of hang out, you're going to get exactly what you put into this gym. Now, I won't ask you to do anything. I don't put myself there first. So I will be an example of what's possible in my own way, but you want to be your way. But I'll show you the standard of what can be done here because I know that if you'll join me in this little part of the journey, you're going to experience more of yourself because it's just a law of you. It's not me. It's the law of physiology, the law of the mind and the emotion. Does this conversation make any sense? Now, let me tell you a mistake most people make in life. They live by a philosophy of someday. Someday I will be able to feel the way I want to feel when. 
when I meet a certain person, when I achieve a certain income, when I finally get that position in my business, when I finally turn things around, when I'm finally physically fit. Someday when. And that someday never shows up because then you meet the person and go, yeah, but did I really make the right choice? <laughs> that really empowers the relationship, right? Or you make the money and then people worry they're going to lose it. Or they achieve the job and then they worry someone else is going to get that position. So someday never comes. So one of the things you've got to do is learn to train your nervous system to feel good. How many find that when you feel good, you're not just happy, but you actually perform better and you also are better in the way you treat other people as well. How many find that to be true? Say, I. <laughs> then I want us to train ourselves like a muscle to feel good, to drill that into our nervous system because feeling good is a physiology. It's a way of moving. It's a way of breathing because the way you feel is totally related to the way that you move. Emotion, ladies and gentlemen, is created by motion, right? Emotion is created by motion. The more you move, the more you're going to feel. And people have very limited emotion and have very limited motion in their face, in their body, and they're kind of holding everything back. So what you want to do is loosen up and be a little crazy. So one way to do that is not to wait to have the good feelings you want. Because, see, you think when something happens, then you're going to feel good. But who's going to make you feel good when that thing happens? You are. You go, well, when I finally make that money, then I'll feel good. Oh, yeah, how do you know? Well, because I'll decide to feel good at that point. Ha <laughs> ha. Why not decide now, feel good while you're on the way to doing that? Do both. Why wait, right? Or, you know, another, it's like. Like people say all the time, you know, they go through a tough situation. They'll someday we'll look back and laugh at this. Why wait? You know, if you're going to do it someday, might as well look back right now and get it over with, right? Start laughing, have some fun with it. Most of us do not have the privilege of an environment that is surrounded with only outstanding people. And if you were to ask me, Tony, before you tell me anything else, what would be the most important tool to influencing the quality of my life forever above all else? My first hands-down answer was the ability to manage your state, the state of your mind and body during tough times. The capacity to do that is the number one skill that will basically determine your destiny. Because the state you are in will determine your decisions about what to believe and what to feel and what to do. And what you do will create the results of your life known as your destiny, at least the one on earth. So the bottom line is, state is everything. So we're going to learn how to master that. But if I had to give you the number two, it's who you surround yourself with, who you associate to is who you will become. Because it's so easy to surround ourselves with people who have a lower standard than we have. And the problem with that is, Sooner or later, if you're around people and you care about them, you don't want to be judging them, so you lower your standard for them. You can't help but lower the standard for you, too, when it's somebody you care about. It happens. It's the old adage, you lie down with dogs, you come up with fleas. It sounds terrible, but it's really accurate. I was speaking for the Marines recently, and um, I'm talking to them, and I'm, <laughs> it was an interesting thing. I went out to Camp Pendleton. There's only two places the Marines train, and I got to be with this huge group a couple thousand of these guys, as well as all of them brand new recruits who just made it through boot camp, and another group of guys that have been on a nine-day wilderness retreat where they don't let them eat for four days and they starve them and everything else, but they didn't want them to miss my talk, so they brought them out in full gear with their black and green paint across their faces, their M40s, right, all standing there at attention while I spoke for four hours. But I was talking to them about standards because the Marines have helped all of those men and women to raise their standards and they have a different quality of life within the context of being a Marine. Now, whether that's the quality of life you want is a whole other thing, but that's what they have. They have a higher physical standard, that's for sure. Mental standard, discipline standard than they ever had in their lives before. And a lot of that had to do with being in that environment. I talked to them about how they have to take that environment wherever they go and have a higher standard than the Marines have. They have to have a higher standard when they leave the Marines. And I was talking later on to one of the generals there, and he was talking to me, and he's saying, Tony, you know, what you said was so on the mark. These men have developed pride in themselves because they've made themselves do things that they normally wouldn't have done. But he said, it's definitely been influenced by this environment. And many of them, when they leave this environment, this will have been the peak of their life in terms of how proud they were of themselves and what they accomplished in their life. They'll, many of them will never do. They'll never translate this standard to their daily life when they leave here. He said, why do you think that is? Do you think it's because people don't care or people are basically lazy or you have to supervise people or, you know, you went through all these things. And I said, no. 
I said, I really think it's that most people's lives are a direct reflection, a direct reflection of the expectations of their peer group. What does that mean? Well, your peer group, first of all, is anybody around you that you respect and you give them emotional power, meaning what they think or what they feel affects you. They're your friend, you want them to like you. So at some level, whether you're aware of it consciously or not, it affects you. Maybe it's your family members. I don't know who your peer group is. Maybe it's people at work. But it's the people that you care what they think or feel. Even if you say you don't, we all care at some level, right? Who are those people for you? That's your peer group. And your life will be a direct reflection of the expectations of your peer group. And here's the challenge. What if you have a higher expectation for your life than the people you surround yourself with? Higher expectation for what you want from your life in terms of your passion or joy or love. Higher expectation of what you want to accomplish. Higher expectation of, of what you want to feel or spirituality or whatever it is. Well, now you have a conflict. Because now what will happen is if you have a higher expectation than your peer group, your peer group who really does care about you will pull you down. Not because they're trying to pull you down because they don't want to lose you. So they'll say, hey, come on, don't be so serious. Don't be working at that all the time. Come on, relax. Jeez, what's the matter with you? And they will find ways to undermine what's going on. Not because they don't love you, because they do love you. Because unconsciously they sense, oh my God, you might change, grow, or expand. What would that mean to me? I could get left behind. And most of us want love so much at an unconscious level, if not at a conscious level. We want acceptance so much that through time, gradually, over the years, we lose what our dreams are. We lose our expectations. And what we once thought was a must is kind of a, well, interesting. We don't even think about it anymore. It's not even a should. Or maybe it's a should someday if all comes together. And so I would say to you that you have an opportunity to get a fresh look at your life. This is a crash course in transforming every area of your life that you want to. The value is we're going to create an environmental standard here that's quite extraordinary. We're going to create it together. Mark my words. Whoever you spend time with, you will become. So you better choose real well. Am I saying get rid of your friends? No. Here's the other way you can do it. You can lead. You can have such a high standard that no matter how low the standard is above you or how nice it is, you can take it from good to excellent to outstanding for your friends if they have the desire and if they have enough caring to be with you. But you're going to have to make those choices. It's not the kind of conversation that you hear in a positive thinking kind of environment. I'm not saying go surround yourself with positive people. I'm saying you got to make sure that wherever you are, you at least have some core friends that have a standard that is so high that both of you will grow. It's like if you want to play tennis, you don't play against somebody who's worse than you are on a regular basis and expect to get better. It just doesn't happen. If you got the guts, you play somebody who's better than you are and you work like crazy so you can move up. And maybe you have some people to play at your level too, but you got to play at that game. Raise that standard. If I was going to say like in two words what this is all about, it's about stepping up, man. And you got to decide to step up or pull back. So you got to take a look and say, okay, what is it that I really want? And i got to make some really conscious choices. And if you make those, you can have more fun than you've ever had before. It's not like a, living a life that's totally disciplined, because discipline never lasts. Because discipline is as painful and you do it anyway. you got to do it anyway in the beginning, but after a while, it becomes natural for you because it's so rewarding to play at this level called outstanding, you won't want to go back. It won't be, i got to discipline myself. It'll be, this is who I am. And that's when things really shift. feel good. The only reason you're not is standards. You don't have a standard to feel good all the time because society says that feeling bad, that's natural. Feeling good all the time, <laughs> you got a problem. Right? Second, you don't believe it. And thirdly, you don't know the strategy consciously. Now here's what you need to understand. Any emotion you're feeling is just a pattern. It's a pattern of how you use your body. It's a pattern of how you use language. And it's a pattern of what you tend to focus on and believe about it. Those three patterns make up all your emotions. If you're upset, you're using your body in a certain way. You're saying certain things outside and inside your head in a certain way. And I don't mean the self-talk positive thinking. I mean certain words trigger you. Like if I say, Michael, you're mistaken. That feels different than if I say, Michael, you are wrong. That feels different than if I say, Michael, you are lying. Right? How many can feel the difference between those three? If someone's saying to you, say, I. 
So there are certain words, we're not like being positive, certain words that will fire off your emotion in different ways, different levels. And your belief, what you're certain is gonna happen affects you. So people get in habits again and again and then they think they're not doing it. They think it just happens because something environment happens and they start doing it. It's just a pattern you learned a long time ago and you've done it so long, it's ingrained. So there are three patterns, I call it the triad, that everything that you feel are created out of and whether you do something or not is based on how you feel. For example, faith, determination are triads. They are nothing but a big word a generalization for three things you're doing when you're determined. Use your body in a certain way when you're determined. You do certain things in your head, what you say to yourself or out loud, and you picture or focus on certain things and believe certain things. When you're fearful, you do something different with your body, something different with your language, something different with what you focus on and believe. How many follow the general thought of this? Say, I. So you don't get depressed, you do depression. See, most people think if they take antidepressants, they won't get depressed. Bull. I do it all the time. Some people take a maximum dosage of six, seven, eight pills at a time. Still get depressed. Because your body will override all of that. Because depression comes from a triad. Some people get depressed because they think they're getting older. Some people get depressed because they think they're going to lose their relationships. Some people get depressed. We all come up with reasons. Whenever you think your future is uncertain, when you feel like you have no future, when you feel completely overwhelmed, like you can't figure it out, then people feel depressed. Doesn't matter how many drugs you take. So the challenge is not that you're not capable of not being depressed. The challenge is that she believes she needs to be depressed. Now, that's a pretty ugly thing to say, but it's true. Because we live in a culture that if you weren't really sad when you lose somebody, then obviously you don't care. But are there cultures, I'm just curious, where, where someone dies, where their belief is death is the beginning and not the end, that death is graduation, and where they not only believe that, like intellectually believe it, but they know it in their soul, and since they believe that and know it, they also believe that to be sad is blasphemy or a form of selfishness because it means you don't really want them to have it. You're thinking about yourself and not their better good. And I'm not suggesting that's all true, but are there cultures that believe that and where people never really feel depressed, yes or no? So what we feel is based upon three patterns, I said. One of those patterns I should tell you right now is a pattern of physiology, which is a fancy word for the way we use our physical body. Now, very often people come to me and they say things like, Mr. Robbins, I don't know what it is, but I just I feel down all the time. <laughs> and other people, I don't know what it is, I feel so up. Why do you think I feel so up all the time? Right? Or some of you come to me and say, Mr. Robbins, I don't know what it is, but I feel angry all the time. You think you could help me? So why don't we start with your face? Okay? I mean, think about it. You don't feel an emotion, you do an emotion. I want you to get this. Now, I know you react, most of you, to some trigger in the environment, but can someone else have the same trigger and react differently, yes or no? That's called wisdom, it's called intelligence, that's called using the gifts God gave you instead of just reacting like an animal. And we all are gonna react at times, but you don't wanna stay there for months and months and months and months, or years, or days, or even hours. You want to raise the standard. So it doesn't mean you don't feel feelings. I mean, I have sad feelings, I have hurt feelings, I have frustration feelings, don't get me wrong, but I don't live there. And sometimes it's good to feel those for a short burst, just enough to get you to do something, to make something better, or to appreciate something. But to live there, see some people do it so much, over and over and over again, until pretty soon, this is all they do, continuously. It's conditioned. And then they go, I can't help it. <laughs> right? I can't, I'm feeling you. Yes, you can. Start talking like a human. Because you behave differently in a different state, and you're totally in control of your state. Your state is not controlled by what someone else says or what someone else does or what you see in the environment. You have one unbelievable gift from your creator that we all cannot deny, and that is the capacity in a moment's notice, in a heartbeat, to change your state. Every hero does it. When the throwing gets tough, somehow they get outside their own fear, their own pain, and they step up. All it is is a state change. A hero is a state of mind. Sometimes it's time to be your own hero instead of waiting for someone else to rescue you. So physiology is the first part. Second pattern is a pattern of language. Now language is an interesting thing. There are two distinctions here. One distinction I call TV. TV stands for transformational vocabulary. 
There are certain words, as I said earlier, that will magnify human emotion and certain words that will lower the intensity of human emotion. So you just got to notice which words. If you say to somebody something like, you know, I really like you a lot, that gives a different experience than if you say, I love you. That's a very different experience than if you said something even more colorful. Transformational vocabulary means there are certain words that just changing a word, you change your states. Like, have you ever heard someone listen to a speaker that just listening to them, like, moved you or inspired you? Like, maybe a Martin Luther King or a John F. Kennedy or somebody of that nature. How many remember somebody like that? Say, I. Well, they moved you with just words and words that have a vocal quality probably attached to it. But guess who's moving you every day with words? You are. But the problem is most of these aren't noticing the key words that either make you depressed or make you excited. Now, sometimes we put a group of words together and we start developing a belief system, but the way we develop it is we incant it. Most of the things you believe started as what I call incantations. What's an incantation? An incantation is like when you say something again and again and again with emotional intensities. It's not like an affirmation. You can go, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. Still not feel happy. That's an affirmation. What turns an affirmation into an incantation is when your entire physiology is involved. Because then what it does, it sends different signals to your nervous system that you mean it when you say something. Like you can say to somebody something like, I love you. Or you can say, I love you. Or you can say, I love you. And you're sending a different message, right, to the body by the way you incanted it. It's not just the word. So an incantation is when you say a phrase again and again with enough physiology, emotional intensity that it wires your brain. It's like, ever had this experience? Somebody says, hey, could you get me the salt? And you think to yourself, I don't know what the salt is, right? And so you say, I don't know what the salt is. And they say, well, it's just in the kitchen. You've been there. It's, it's on the second shelf. I don't know where it is. Come on, just go get it. I don't know where the salt is. Come on, go get it. Yourself. I don't know where it is. Go get it. Fine. I don't know where the salt is. I don't know what the salt is. I can't find the salt. I can't find the salt. You open up, I can't find the salt. You look, I can't find the salt. It's not here. It's on the second shelf. Can't find the salt. Can't find the salt. Can't find it. I can't. I can't find the salt. They walk in, stand right next to you, reach right in front of your face, and go, what is this? How many have had one of these experiences? Say, I. Now, did your eyes see the salt? Yes. But your brain did not allow you to perceive the salt because you incanted 20 times. You couldn't find it, and your brain doesn't want to make you turn you into a liar. Okay? And we do this to ourselves all the time. Right? In, in psychology, there's a term for it. We call it a scotoma, a blind spot. Where you ever talk to somebody and, like, you're using light, they can't even see it. It's, like, right there in their face, and it's an idea because they've been incanting it forever. So people come to me, Mr. Robbins, I, I, I just can't figure out what I want for my life. I can't figure out what I want. I don't know what I want. I can't figure out what I want. Why do you think I can't figure out what I want? Maybe because you just said 12 times I can't figure it out with total emotional intensity. Maybe a clue. Okay? You have to be careful about your incantations. Okay? Now, so language, there's certain phrases we use, there's certain words we use that lock us into those states. They're like hypnosis. Like, remember in the, you know, you read mythology or the times of King Arthur, and, you know, Merlin the magician would come along and he would incant these phrases over and over again, right? And it would happen, he'd turn a frog into a prince or a prince into a frog. Well, that's what we're doing to ourselves all the time. So we've got to be smart and start noticing those triggers. And those phrases put you in those states. It's not what happened. It's what you're doing with your body and it's what you're encanting or the words you're using. Then the third pattern that creates any emotion you're feeling is the pattern of what you focus on and what you believe about it. Focus slash belief. What you focus on and what you believe about it. If you are in a position where you believe that nothing ever works for you, then that belief will begin to take over and you'll start to feel that way. Now, if you take somebody who's depressed and you give them a drug, Will it work? Yes, because it changes the pattern of physiology for the moment. When you change someone's biochemistry, that changes the way they respond for the moment. But when that person takes that drug, but then they keep focusing on what they don't want or they don't have in their life, or what's missing, or they don't have a future, and they keep encanting it, even though they took the drug, these two will overpower this one. That's how someone can take a drug, an antidepressant, and still be depressed. And the person says, oh, we just got the wrong brand. Let's mix two of these together and overcome it. See, what that's called is trying to put a Band-Aid on something that's not going to heal because you haven't dealt with the source of it. And dealing with the source of it is really quite easy. We've got to change the belief that makes us keep using that physiology. 
But very often, we don't have to do that. We just change the pattern of physiology. The belief goes away. The secret, though, is to condition it so it stays. Now, obviously, there's more to it than what I'm talking about, but this is the fundamental basis of making your life work. Because whatever you think your life working is will come down to some emotions. You want to feel love and joy and excitement and passion and peace and connection to God and your friends and all that stuff. And guess what? You're doing all of it or you're not doing all of it. And if you're not doing it, we just got to see what are you doing and let's change it. The only reason you don't is you don't believe it's possible. The only reason you don't is because you keep using the same physiology. You go, I don't know why I'm so scared. I don't know why. And then all of a sudden we change it and everything shifts. And then what we now do is condition it. So the question is this, what is it that stops you from getting what you want? And the answer is fear. That's it, fear of failure, fear of success, fear of rejection, fear of the unknown, feeling of being disappointed, that fear, fear of not looking good, it's just fear. Now, no achievers ever admit to being fearful, they're just stressed. You say, well, I'm really stressed because I'm not going to make the meeting. What you're really saying is, I'm afraid I'm not going to make the meeting. Well, what happens if you don't make the meeting? Then someone will be upset with me, or I won't be this, or I won't be perfect, or I won't be whatever, and I won't meet the rules, and then I won't feel good. It's fear. Next time you say you're stressed, just tell yourself the truth. You're afraid, right? Even if you're an achiever, yes, you do have fears. Having fears is called being human. The secret, though, is when you identify it, is to attack it and to change it. And the fastest way, by the way, of these three to change one state is the first quadrant of the triad, physiology. A radical change in physiology will change you faster than anything you can try and think yourself into. Because what you're doing is it's like changing the plug, you know? You got a great computer, but you don't plug it in, it's not gonna work too well. And when you change your physiology, it's like TV, it's like changing the channel. Now you go from a sad story to an adventure, just by making a change in the channel, the way you use your physiology in that moment, okay? So think of it in those terms. Physiology, language, focus slash belief. Anything you want to change will come down to changing those three things. I got a phone call, found out there's a lady, some of you remember, an entertainer named Carly Simon. Carly Simon uh, couldn't get on stage. And I heard she couldn't get on stage. and. Uh, somebody was talking to me and I wasn't able to come help her because I just wasn't available. But I did find out from the friend what her symptoms were. Here's what she would do. She would do something very similar to what I had seen as a pattern with someone else. In fact, let me give you this someone else first. I meet Bruce Springsteen for the first time. Meet Bruce and I'm a big fan. I'm like really excited to meet him. Like he's my hero, right? And so I go up to talk to him and everything else. And as I'm talking to him, he's really nice. And I said, you know, tell me something. What's it like for you on stage? Do you still get juiced? Is it still like, are you, does your, your body get going? Does your mind get going? Or are you just really relaxed? Like, what's it like for you? I'm curious after all these years. He said, are you kidding me? He said, every single time I go out there, he said, I feel a certain thing happen in my body. I want you to hear these parallels. Here's what Carly Simon says. Here's what he says about going on stage. Carly Simon says, when I think about going on stage, what happens is my heart starts beating really, really fast. And she goes, and then my whole thing, my, my, my muscles and my hands start to tighten up and I start to sweat and my breathing starts to speed up. And as I think about going out there, she says, everything starts speeding up faster and faster. I feel all this tension, all this pressure. And she goes, and then I know I'm having a panic attack and I can't go out. Bruce Springsteen says, you know, when I think about going out there, he said, like, everything in my body starts speeding up. And he said, I feel this tension in my hands. I start sweating. He said, just still today, just like before, my heart starts beating like crazy. He said, right then I go, man, I know I'm ready. Someone starts to feel something, go, oh my God, oh my God, I'm so, I'm, I'm so stressed, right? Oh, I'm feeling stressed. You could go, oh, I'm feeling excited. Because stressed and excited are very close, aren't they? And what happens is a subtle change, and usually when you put the language on it, it shifts it. You may have been on the verge, you could go from either one. Someone says, oh, oh I'm breaking down, I'm breaking down. No, maybe you're breaking through. So you gotta know that this is not some fancy schmancy, like psychobabble. This is human physiology. So fear is the only thing that stops you. How fast can you get out of fear? Heartbeat. But most of you don't for two reasons. It's not a must. You don't have a standard that says, I must. When you must, you do. Watch people in war. Some of them go collapse, but most of them figure it's a must, and they figure it out, don't they? I go watch that an unbelievably intense movie about uh, Private Ryan. I haven't seen it, but I've heard a bunch of people tell me about it. It sounds like you get a real reality check of what war is like, and you see 
how people function in that environment. It's just a must, so they figure it out. Stuff they would never normally do day to day. They could never handle day to day. They have to, so they do. Don't make life make you have to. You make the have to's. So it's proactive. So fear is what stops it. What changes our whole life is action. Why don't we take action? Fear. What do we gotta do to get ourselves to do it? We gotta make sure that we push ourselves through it by making a decision. The point in which change happens is a decision. Every change in your life that you want will come from something simple, a decision. People go, what does it take to change? Decide. But you go, oh, God sounds so simple and so basic. Was that easy? You'd already have done it, Mr. Robbins. No, it is that easy and you're still not doing it because you are not putting yourself in a state to decide. See, a real decision is not like a preference. It's not like where you say, I'll try it and see. That's not a decision. Decision comes from Latin. It means like incision to cut off from. Decision is when you cut off any possibility except the thing you're committed to. It's like that is it. How many of you in this room have ever smoked cigarettes and then one day you finally decided no more, I mean really decided, and you've never touched again and you're not even tempted to? How many made that decision at one time? Say I. You know what a real decision is. If I came to you today and I said, would you like a cigarette? Would you go, what brand is it? No, you'd probably say to me, no, I'm not a... I want you to hear that. You'd not only say, I don't smoke. You'd say, I'm not even that kind of person. You literally divorce yourself from even that kind of person. So it's no effort. When you really decide, it's not an effort. Once you've cut it off, it doesn't take effort. Deciding takes effort, but once you've decided, it's over. You don't think about it anymore. It's like it's easier to fast than it is to diet. Because when you're fasting, somebody offers you something, you don't even think about it. You go, no, I'm not eating. Right? When you're dieting, you're like, well, maybe we can have a little more. This is a little piece of cake. Not that many calories. Right? And pretty soon you're back to where you were again. So a real decision is what you got to make. When you make a real decision, life changes. But it's a real decision. You burn your bridges. You only move forward. Now, the way to get yourself there is to put yourself in state and condition it. Conditioning is this. Build the muscle. Do you do it one time? No. You do it a lot and you do beyond what you're comfortable with and the muscle expands. And now what used to be hard to do as the muscle grows is easy. That's the same thing with every other kind of muscle. But I'll give you one example. They take monkeys. And I don't approve of this research, but this is what they do. And UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine, they've done these studies where they take monkeys and they will take four of their fingers and tape them down. And then they take one finger and they bend it back and forth 10,000 times. And every time they bend this finger back and forth like this, use this as a metaphor. In your brain, for you to do this once, twice, you have to make connections between neurons in your brain. Neuron's a big word for nerve cells. So to do this, imagine as a metaphor, it's not exactly like this, to do this once, you got to put a connection, a thin thread had to be grown between this neuron and this neuron, as an example, as a metaphor. Do it again, two thin threads. Do it 10,000 times, and guess what? You are wired to do this. Here's the point. They untape the monkey's fingers, and what does he do constantly? For no good reason. He's wired, conditioned to do this. Now, how does this relate to you? Well, how many of you go to work the same way every day? You drive on the same on-ramp, go the same direction, get off on the same on-ramp. How many got a pattern like that? Say, I. How many have had a day when you're supposed to go the opposite direction on the freeway or the road, but you're on the cell phone and your brain is at the lunch and you get on the same on-ramp going the same direction that you normally do that's the wrong way? Say, I. You're monkeys. Can you condition yourself to feel depressed to where it literally, it feels more comfortable because you go there more often and you're wired to be there? Yes or no? Can you condition yourself to be quick to anger, yes or no? Can you condition yourself to feeling overwhelmed at the drop of a hat? Can you condition yourself to feel loved all the time? Even if people say, I hate you. Yes, could you still feel loved? Could you condition yourself to feel happy as a consistent way of living all the time, yes or no? But you know what, most people don't believe that, but of course it is, it's the same nervous system. But the environment reinforces negative behavior more than positive. People go, how's it going? Oh, my life is so great. Oh, easy for you. So pretty soon you learn to go, yeah, I'm doing okay. You don't want to get too good because then your peer group would be unhappy with you because they're not feeling so good. So you learn to downplay it and then you don't reward yourself so your brain doesn't go for more because it goes, we got to stay right on in here. This is our little comfort zone. 
So we're going to condition ourselves to be in a peak state, especially when you're exhausted. Because like, remember when you're doing the muscle? When you, the one where you can't lift one more and you make yourself do it, that's where you get all the growth. So when you're most tired is when you've got to push yourself. If you didn't listen to anything I said, but all you did was keep yourself in a peak state for three days, you'll develop something called emotional muscle. And emotional muscle is where your whole life comes in. Repetition is the mother of skill until it gets conditioned, until it's automatic. Now I'll give you a clue. You know what I told you about them doing this with the finger of the animal? Here's what they discovered. Don't have to do this 10,000 times. All you got to do is do this about two dozen max, three dozen. If every time they do this, they stimulate the pleasure center of the brain of the animal. And they do that literally physically by pushing a little uh, needle in the area of the brain that creates pleasure. But what happens is when you do this, they do this and they create pleasure. Instead of one string, they get like 500 every time you do it with pleasure. So what happens is you can condition yourself with that pleasure and you can get this done in a short time. It doesn't have to take you five years. So we want to purposely put ourselves in these peak states over and over again, not as a rah-rah session, but literally as a training tool for our human nervous system. How many follow this? Say I. And the secret is when you don't feel like doing it, that's when you got to do it the most. Because that's when you'll get the real conditioning. But don't just do it like, all right, yes, 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 yes. Okay? You gotta smile and make yourself feel good while you're doing it and make it better each time. How many of you have ever said, I want to change something? Like, I want to lose weight, I want to this, I want to that and you started to create change only to go back to where you were. How many have done this? Say I. I. I want to show you how to create lasting change because anybody can change for the moment. But lasting change is what you're really after. And I'll tell you a little background on this, two second background. Most of my career early on, I just loved people and I wanted to make changes in my own life initially. So I became obsessed with saying, okay, what are the best tools? How can I change? And early in my life, when I was about 16 years old, I decided I want to read a book a day. Because I figured, man, if I could take 10 years, like someone took 10 years to write a book, let's say, and I could take 10 years of their experience and absorb it in a day, and I did that for the course of a couple of years, I realized, I believed anyway, I would have such an incredible experiential base without having to have all the years. And I did it primarily because I wanted to improve myself. I wanted to make changes. I grew up in an environment I didn't like. Well, I didn't quite do that, but I read about 700 books over the period of about seven or eight years, seven and a half years, all in the area of human development, psychology, physiology, anything I thought could really make a difference for people. And then what I did was I actually applied what I learned to a great extent because lots of people get lots of knowledge, but they don't use it. So I kept trying to use it, and as I made changes in myself, it became natural as I got excited and saw results, and my friends saw results in me, start helping my friends. And then I got addicted to that. I got addicted to having the solutions and being able to help people I really cared about. And pretty soon by the time I was in high school, I was known as Mr. Solution. You had a problem, you saw me. Especially if you were a girl and had a problem with your boyfriend, I would be happy to change those problems, right? But the point of the matter is, I really did. I mean, I was obsessed by it. And then as I developed this as my career, I developed more and more skills. And then gradually, by the time I was 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, I became exposed to a series of what at that time were the cutting edge tools in creating change, like really rapid fire change. Not lying on your back, freely associating and analyzing what's wrong with your life, but, but really making the change happen now. And in those days, the tools were things like neuro-linguistic programming, which you probably have heard of by now, which I wouldn't honestly say is cutting edge anymore, but there's some great tools in there that I still use, some of which I'll share with you this weekend. They're just great, fundamental tools. And Gestalt, which is really antiquated now, but there's still some useful tools in it, or Ericksonian patterns. And I went out and I learned this stuff, and I learned how you could like wipe out a person's lifetime phobia in 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, as opposed to four, five, six, or seven years. And my advantage was I didn't know what I couldn't do because I didn't have years of being a therapist and having to spend years with a customer or a client trying to help them turn around. And so when I went to these classes, I convinced the owner to let me, or I should say the founder of these technologies, and at least in NLP, his name was John Grinder, to let me in these classes. Because in those days, it was always marriage and family counselors, psychologists, and psychiatrists. I had no such degrees, but that was my advantage. And I talked my way in these classes just by pure persistence. And I sat in the classes, and after three or four days, we'd learned like how to wipe out a phobia. 
in a short period of time. And I remember turning to these, it was a six month course, and I turned to these other therapists in the class and I said, hey guys, let's go find some phobics and cure them. And they all looked at me like, you're crazy, you're insane, it's obvious you're not an educated man. I said, what do you mean? They go, well this is a six month training program. You gotta go through all six months. Then you go through a testing procedure. And then if you qualify the testing procedure, then you get certified. And then once you're certified, you can start doing this with people. I went, are you insane? I'm a business person. I'm waiting for somebody to certify me to apply something that's useful. I said, I'm gonna go do it now. So picture this in your mind. I'm in Los Angeles, California. I've got four days of training. It's 11 o'clock at night and I'm looking for someone to help. <laughs> I thought, where do you go to help somebody at 11 o'clock? Where do you find somebody who needs help at 11 o'clock at night in LA? Denny's. <laughs> I figure anybody at Denny's at 11 o'clock at night needs help. Right? So I walk in, true story. I walk into this Denny's 24 hour place. It was right near the hotel where I was learning my tools. And I walk in, and this guy's standing behind the counter there, you know, I mean, excuse me, sitting behind the counter with his meal. And I walk by and he goes, Excuse me, sir, my name is Tony Robbins. Tell me any problem you have, I'm going to handle it right now. And gradually I began to realize this was not the best approach. And so I launched my career starting in Canada and I did it by challenging traditional psychiatrists and psychologists by saying, tell me your worst patient, I don't care who they are, I'm gonna handle it right here, right now. Because what happens when I first went on the air, I'd say I could cure anything, I don't care what it is, I don't care if you're phobic, whatever. And then what would happen is people call up and I'd say yes and I give them a money back guarantee to get results. But the psychiatrist in the early day would attack me. Say I was a liar and a charlatan, it was impossible. So all I would do is say, great, give me your worst patient. Give me somebody you've never been able to cure. I said, I'm sure you have plenty of those. You know, I had to work with them, right? And after about, I don't know, not even three months of doing that, my reputation got aligned, no one ever attacked me anymore. And I, as the years went by, I got a little bit more mature. I mean, the truth was I didn't have a degree and I was sensitized, so I didn't have a degree and I, I was defensive about it. And then if someone attacked me, obviously I attacked back as hard as I could. Fortunately, I had some skills to attack back with where I could get results instead of just attacking. But as the years went by, I got more mature and I said, I know who I am. I don't need to prove it to anybody else. And, you know, now that I've got a couple million people that I've trained, I also have about 15,000 psychiatrists and psychologists. So as a result, things changed. But what really became my trademark was this challenge format where I would go out and I'd say, I don't care what your problem is, stand up here, I'm gonna handle it now. And I'd do these in those days in free guest events to build my reputation so that people would see my work was real and then they'd sign up to come to my seminars. And when you do that a lot, pretty soon your whole life becomes, what's your problem, boom, what's your problem, boom, what's your problem, boom. And I got so wired by that and I was just doing whatever it took to create change within people. But then I had an experience and I was really proud of myself. The years went by, you know, I was very successful in what I was doing, loved what I did. And then I had a really neat learning experience that helped me to understand lasting change even more powerfully. And the experience was a man came to one of my seminars and during one of the breaks, he walked up to me and said, do you recognize me? He was very intense. And I said, I don't remember your name, but I do recognize you. I said, I meet about 10,000 people a month, but I recognize your face, I never forget a face. It's only think for a second. I said, I don't know your name, but you're from New York. Right? Which is probably a good guess by his intensity anyway, right? <laughs> Right. But seriously, I do remember he's from New York. He said, yeah, I said, I did a smoking therapy on you like, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. He said, that's right. I said, how you doing? He reached in his pocket, he pulls out a pack of cigarettes, camels, sticks in my face, he goes, you failed. And I felt myself get a little angry. I said, don't get angry, learn, learn, learn. Stay centered, learn. So I said, wow. I said, so you're smoking? He said, yeah. I said, well, what happened? I worked with you back then for an hour. How long have you been smoking at that time? He said, 16 years. I said, how many packs a day were you smoking? He said, three packs, sometimes four. I said, okay, so 16 years. And I said, so I came work for you about an hour, right? I said, what happened? He said, I stopped smoking. I said, for how long? He said, for four years. And I'm looking at him, right? I said, you'd smoke for 16 years, three or four packs a day, right? I work you for an hour. You don't smoke another cigarette for four years. Now you're smoking and I screwed up? He said, that's right, because you didn't program me properly or I wouldn't have gone back to it. And when he said that, I went, ah, hmm, something to think about. I went, wow, neurolinguistic programming, which was what I was teaching in those days, gives you this illusion that someone else is gonna program you and then everything will be fine. But see, my life doesn't work because I programmed myself 20 years ago and everything's perfect. My life works because I've conditioned myself. There's a difference. 
Because conditioning, you can condition yourself enough that you stay pumped, but you have to keep yourself in that environment. It's like you don't go work out once and go, now I'm fit for life, right? You make it part of your life, part of your lifestyle. It's self-reinforcing and you love it. It's who you are. And that's why you're fit and strong and healthy and so forth. So I thought, isn't this interesting? Because I'm so wanting to help people, I'm being the source of it. So I went out and I did a little research project with three of my associates, and we called 100 people that I'd done work with over the years to see how they did. Of those 100 people, roughly 97%, 97 of them, had had lasting change. There was three of them that didn't. In all three cases, they had the exact same pattern. I hadn't programmed them, some language like that. So what I began to realize, and I continue to follow up over the next few years, is that really there are three beliefs you have to have first to have lasting change, and then there are three steps you have to take. So first, let's do the three beliefs, okay? The first belief you must have to have lasting change is that change is a must and not a should. So you have to believe that something must change. Not that something should change. If someone says, you know, I really should go on a diet, I go, eh, ain't gonna happen. As I know, should never happens. Should you do when it's convenient. Should is not consistent. Musts are the things we find a way to do because we go, it is a must. We take it to a different level of consequence in our bodies and our minds and our emotions and our spirits. So if there's something you haven't changed and you keep thinking about it but still hasn't changed, I guarantee you one of these or more of these three beliefs is missing. First one that's probably likely is you really think you should change but it's not a total, absolute must in your gut. Now, some people really is. They think, well, this weight must come off, you know, but then I'm gonna run to Jenny Craig or someone else to do it for me. Now, there's nothing wrong with Jenny Craig. She's great as a coach, but if Jenny Craig's the one doing it for you or Tony Robbins the one doing it for you, then I get the muscle and you don't. So I'll be stronger and healthier and you'll be okay for a while until you get off in some uncomfortable thing. Then you can blame me or Jenny Craig or someone else why it didn't work. But if you know you're the source, then there's only one place to look, which is in the mirror. So it cannot be based on someone else. It's got to be, it must change, and I must change it. Now, some people believe, okay, this weight must come off, and I know I must be the one to do it, right? But, or, you know, this environment, something's got to be done, and I know I must do something, but they have a third belief that keeps them from doing it. And that third belief you've got to have to do it is, I can change it. I can change it. Why is this one important? Why do you gotta believe it's not only change, it's a must, but also, secondly, believe I must change it, and most importantly, I can. Because if you don't believe you can change it, then are you gonna put a bunch of energy and effort and force into something you think's not gonna work? Of course not. For you to really get the result that you want, you have got to believe you can. So very often people go, yeah, this weight must come off, I know I must do it, but I can't. Why? They'll say, I tried everything, right? I've tried millions of things. I've tried it all. You've not tried it all. You've not tried everything, or you would have got results. But we start telling ourselves these stories, and we start believing those incantations. Now, one of the reasons they believe they can't do it is because they never have before. So I want to give you a core belief to write down that's really, really important, and that is this. The past does not equal the future. The past does not equal the future. The past does not equal the future. See, so often people say, I can't do this. Well, it's because they haven't done it before, or they've never done it, or they think they've tried everything. Well, you haven't tried everything, and if you try to drive in the future using a rearview mirror to guide yourself, I got news for you, you're going to crash. You have to be able to look forward and create what you want, even if you've never been able to do it before. If you just tried it and it didn't work, this moment is new. Something about you is new. You made a new distinction. Something you may be unaware of. Maybe the environment's changed. Maybe you just need to change your approach. But you've got to believe that you can because the only reason to say you can't is you think you've tried everything, which is a lie, or you believe that it just has never worked before. The past does not equal the future unless you live there. If you live in the past, then I guarantee your future will be the same way. Now, these are just beliefs, but beliefs control our actions. You might want to write down another phrase, and that is all beliefs carry with them consequences. All beliefs carry with them consequences. Human behavior is belief-driven. Okay? All beliefs carry with them consequences, and human behavior is belief-driven. What does that mean? 
It simply means that if somebody does something, they got a reason. Even though it may seem insane to you, even if they may not know what the reason is consciously, they got a reason. It's based on something they believe, that by doing this, it'll give them something they need or want unconsciously, some set of feelings they need. That's why people do what they do. So we all need to understand what a belief is, because people make a belief into a thing, and all a belief is is a feeling. A belief is a feeling. That's all it is, right? A belief is a feeling of certainty. That's all a belief is. A belief is a feeling of certainty about what something means. So when you say, I believe this, you're saying, I'm certain about this. If you say, Tony, I believe I'm an intelligent person, what you're saying is, Tony, I feel what? I feel what? Certain that I'm an intelligent person, okay? That's all a belief is. Now let me give you a metaphor. What's the difference between an idea and a belief? Well, you can have an idea that the world is flat, but not believe it, not feel certain that the world is flat. Or you can have a belief that the world is round and be certain the world is round. Let me give you a metaphor for it. Here's the difference between an idea and a belief. An idea is like a tabletop with no legs. Now, what's the problem with the tabletop with no legs? If you push against it, what's it going to do? Fall down. There's nothing to hold it up. There's nothing to make it solid or certain. What a belief is, is a tabletop with legs underneath it to support it. So let me give you an example. I want you to think about something for a moment. How many of you have references? I'm not saying you believe this, but you have experiences. Now, by the way, references can be things you've experienced, things you've read about, things people have told you, or even things you've imagined. Can you imagine enough things that you're certain how things are? Like make up something in your head and then find out later you were dead wrong? How many have ever done this? Say I. Okay, so references are not just experiences from the past. There are things you can make up, read about, etc. How many of you have some beliefs that intellectually you know better, but emotionally they still control you? How many have some beliefs like this? Say I. Okay, so the only reason you develop a belief is so you can feel certain and make decisions quickly about how to get pleasure or how to avoid pain. So the only way you get rid of a belief is you destroy it by sweeping the legs, like questioning these references. Like in a, in a martial arts competition, you take out somebody's legs, their fight disappears. Same thing is true with a belief. The other way you can get rid of it is by linking a massive amount of what to the old belief that doesn't serve you? A massive amount of what? Pain. If you link enough to it, your brain will avoid it, and now you have a chance to create an alternative, okay? So now, let's talk about what are the three steps. These are the three beliefs. It must change, I must change it, I can change it. What are the actual three steps to creating change? Here's the first step. You want to create lasting change in yourself or someone else. This is always step one. If you tried and failed to create change, this is the thing you didn't have enough of, and it's called leverage. Leverage. What is leverage? Well, leverage is when a person in their mind, in their body, in their emotion, in their nervous system, when they link up, that not changing, like failing to change right now, will mean unbearable, immediate, devastating levels of pain. I guarantee you they'll find a way to change. Like what if you said, I'm really depressed, and I put a gun to your head and said, get happy quicker, I'm gonna blow your brains out. How many think you might be able to find a way to get happy rapidly? Let me see your hands. Whereas for years you were sitting on a therapist's couch and you couldn't handle it. The only difference is I brought more of what to the table? Leverage, greater consequence. The reason we don't change is on the one hand we want to change because we're not thoroughly happy. But on the other hand we're afraid changing itself might be painful or we might go through that whole process and it still might not work and then we'd be disappointed and that feel even worse. So the reason we don't change is we think change equals pain. The reason we do change is when we see not changing is more painful than anything else. So to get leverage, you want to accomplish two things. You want to get the person you're wanting to change, whether it be yourself or someone else, to associate. Associate means not just intellectualize. It's like intellectually you may know chocolate's not good for you, but that's not going to change your behavior until we mix it with tuna casserole in your nervous system. When it's in your gut, now your body will respond. When it's in your head, it's intellectual. So when I say associate, think about association means something you feel in your nervous system rather than something you understand intellectually. How many follow that? Say I. So to get leverage, you want someone to associate, feel in their gut that not changing 
not changing equals massive. Here's the other key word, immediate, unbearable levels of pain. So to get someone to change, if you've tried everything and it doesn't work, you need more leverage. Get yourself or that person you're working with, whoever you're trying to create change with, to associate that if I don't change, it's gonna mean massive, immediate, unbearable levels of pain. Some key words there, massive. Another key word, immediate. You might say, you know what, if I keep smoking, I'll probably get cancer. You know what the problem with that is? It's not immediate. It's way off in the future, in the distance. So when you put it further away, it almost didn't have much effect, did it? Well, when something is thought of as to be way off in the future, even if it's bad, it doesn't give us enough leverage to change. When it's immediate, that's when it gets us to change. Now, people don't want to change just for painful reasons, so the other form of leverage is this. You want to get this person to associate, which means in their gut, not in their intellect, that changing now, to change now, equals massive, extraordinary, and immediate levels of what, guys? Pleasure. See, when you link up in your brain, changing is pleasurable and not changing is ultimate pain, the person will find the way. Write this in your notes somewhere. Change is never a matter of ability. Change is never a matter of ability. It's always a matter of motivation. Another word for that is leverage. When someone has enough reasons, they will flat change, period. But you gotta get enough leverage. And I'll tell you how we keep ourselves from getting leverage. We use words that soften what we're doing. Like we say, well, I'm a, I'm a bit overweight, or I'm a, you know, I'm a little bit, you know, robust, or, you know, I'm, you know, I'm round, you know, in big places and stuff. No, you're fat is what you are, okay? Okay? And you've got to call a spade a spade. Because as long as you say, well, I'm kind of, you know, a little smidge overweight, you're never going to do it. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't care if you're overweight. I don't judge you. I care about you. I don't want your heart to be working 20 times harder than it needs to be and have you die a young death. I don't care about how you look, that's your business. But if you're overweight, the reason you're overweight is you don't give yourself enough pain for it. You do softeners because you don't want to feel bad about yourself because you think you've tried everything. So I've tried everything, nothing's worked, so I just got to adjust to this. So I want you to get it. You got to tell yourself the truth. I'm telling you this as a friend, I'm not telling you this from judgment. And by the way, do we all do this at different levels, yes or no? And by the way, this isn't just fat, we do this with finances, right? We do this with drugs. We do this with the relationships that don't serve us. You gotta flyingly tell yourself the truth. And that's painful, but that pain will serve you because it will move you. It's like Stallone. If he'd gone off and made himself feel good, he would have lost his hunger and drive. So that's why he didn't take on another job. He stayed there in the pain so he'd have to be driven forward. How many follow that? Say I. But you know what most of us do? The minute we get a little pain, we want to immediately get rid of it. So we drink something, we eat something, we smoke something, we watch something to take away the pain of the moment. But when you take away the pain, you take away the drive to change. And so now change is not a must, it's a should. And so you keep on feeling bad about yourself, never getting what you really deserve. Whether it be the mind, the body, the spirit, the emotion that you deserve. So you got to be honest with yourself. How many follow this? Say I. You gotta not only be honest, you gotta pour it on a little bit and get enough drive. It's uncomfortable. But that discomfort will give you the leverage to really finally do something that is lasting. Okay? Really, 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 really critical here. By the way, think of a change in your own life or maybe someone you know that was really hard for you to make. Like, really hard. You kept trying to change, kept trying to change, never followed through. And finally, one day, wham! He said, that's it. No more. Never again. It's over. How many have had one of those experiences where you finally got so mad, you got so much pain, you finally changed forever? How many have had one of those? Say, I. That's the day you got enough leverage. Now, you don't want to wait for life to have to do that to you. You want to be conscious about it. You want to be direct about it so you get what you deserve. That's what you really have to do. How many have ever done this in a relationship? You're in a relationship, it's a terrible relationship, but you keep rationalizing it. Well, it used to be good. It'll be good again. Because see, if the present is painful, you can always escape to the past. If the past is painful, you can always make up a future that's better. Because no one really knows about the future, so you can make stuff up. And as you make it up, it's a reference that makes you more certain it'll be okay, and you kind of stay where you are. 
How many of you got in a relationship at one point where you finally said, I have had it, it was painful in the past, it's painful in the present, it's going to be painful in the future, I am out of here. And you got enough leverage. How many have done this? Say I. But until you were honest with yourself that way, you hung out in numbness. See, most people live in a world that I call no man's land. They're in a place where they're not really happy, but they're not unhappy enough to do anything about it. And that's the worst possible place you can be. That's being in a rut. So we got to get leveraged.